Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going directly into the show tonight because we've got to cover a massive amount of information in two hours. This is a special broadcast. My very special guest, Dr. Steve Pachinik, America's national hero, as so many publications who know who he is have already declared him to be. He was a deputy under Secretary of State under five different presidents. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the man you read about when you read about Tom Clancy's novel and the hero in Tom Clancy's novel. The interesting thing is is that uh, the books that he has written with Clancy have been 26 times on the New York bestsellers list. He's got multiple PhDs, and this is a man that has served his country for all of his life, who loves his country, and now is absolutely heartbroken and determined with all his might to do whatever he can to inform the people that it is late in the game. With that information, I want you to welcome Dr. Steve Pachinik. Hi, Steve. Hi, uh, Steve. It's always a pleasure. Hello to the audience. I think some of you may remember me for a couple of months ago where Steve and I were on the show and talking about the impending crash of the banks and uh, how uh, the system would collapse and that even a transition of power into a new administration wouldn't change very much. And unfortunately, Steve, I think you're correct. We have, again, a major, major problem in the United States. It's a continuing problem. It's a continuing problem that the government has no longer served the people. The government is superseding the rights of the individual. The Constitution is still being suppressed by the Patriots Act, by the uh, uh, Wiretap Act, by the writ of habeas corpus, which uh, has not been invoked, and by an administration that feels we need a war, still another war, in Afghanistan, which, of course, the president himself said, ironically, is of defeat and it's a disaster, but he's still sending 17,000 to 30,000 new boys. So we have once again a conundrum, and once again our politicians have lied, betrayed, and deceived us. So the old adage, Steve, the more the thing that things change, the more they remain the same, couldn't be more apropos for this time, could it? Well, it couldn't be, Steve, but what makes it more lethal in this case, as you know, I went against Bush Jr. I had worked with our military to basically reestablish and get rid of the neocons at the time and uh, bring in some of uh, Bush Sr.'s uh, people like Gates and others who were more reasonable. Unfortunately, what's happening in this administration is that Obama has a personality trait that knows really no restrictions on what he will say to anybody in anything and will promise everything to anybody. Of course, by definition, that's a politician. But what makes him particularly different is that he is really raising expectations and false expectations and cannot fulfill his promise. And in that process, he has created a vitriolic vacuum which eventually will create disturbance and violence in the streets, which he knows very well will be imminent. And that's why he and his minions, uh, his immediate minions in the White House, elsewhere, who, by the way, have not changed. They're the same defunct minions who were there in the Carter administration when I was there, Richard Holbrook, uh, a whole bunch of them, uh, Hillary Clinton. I mean, you're talking about people who have never proven their mettle and their worth, have been reshuffled through and went through the Clinton administration with our great president, Bill Clinton, who uh, was fellated in the White House, who was cowardly in foreign affairs, who created the rendition. Most people don't know that he was the uh, uh, founder of the rendition, that is, people being taken overseas and tortured, and then it was continued by Bush. And basically, uh, what we had was false promises and the Carter admin Clinton administration back in. I mean... This was really, to me, uh, amazing that the American public fell for everything that he said and uh, the psyops that was performed because basically these are 90% of Hillary Clinton's people. And Clinton's people. So there was no change in administration. We right. had a corrupt Clinton, we had a corrupt Bush, now we have a corrupt Obama. Everybody on his team is exceedingly corrupt and ineffectual. Well, let me ask you this question because this is going to, we're going to cover a lot of ground. As you know, we're right into right. The, the subject. Let me talk about some of your foreign experience in the field and talk about the same uh, principles being applied to the United States that, quite candidly, you originated when you were responsible for taking down the Soviet Union, putting out Pol Pot. Give the people so they understand this is your expertise. This is why you were the Deputy Secretary, uh, you know, Deputy Undersecretary 
Uh, well, let me just correct this. I'll give it. The, I'll give the people. A, a, you know, the title sounds fancy. It was a deputy assistant secretary of state. By right. some of you will remember me. Some of you won't. But that's fine. Uh, it sounds a little bit more phenomenal than it is. Uh, my official title is deputy assistant secretary of state. It was created by me by Secretary of State Kissinger and President Nixon because I was trained at Harvard in psychiatry and had a PhD in national relations. I, be, I was an expert probably the first world expert on hostage negotiating, developed, developed all the principles, strategy, and tactics that would eventually use uh, and unfortunately were bastardized by the FBI that did not perform well. We will discuss that later on throughout about 20, 30 years. They, they're great self-promoters. But basically what I did was to create strategies, tactics, not to basically talk about somebody's addiction or their mental health, but to really understand uh, how do you neutralize uh, somebody like Arafat. Uh, what is it that you have to do in order to capture him? Uh, what is it that we have to do to take down the Soviet Union? And in the case of Reagan, because he was unusually smart and also because he was in the movie business, he understood the power of several elements. So when I was uh, commissioned to do this, I went to the Rand Corporation in, in Santa Monica and developed the architecture for the takedown of the Soviet Union, uh, creating uh, using several different variables. Number one, I had worked in the Soviet Union under Nixon to take Christians out of a psychiatric hospitals who were incarcerated uh, uh, unfairly and illegally under a psychiatric term called sluggish schizophrenia, which did not exist. So I created, I commoditized the Christians who were incarcerated and we got them out uh, using uh, uh, various other elements. So I understood the Russian mentality. Number two, uh, I used the elements of the church that was the Pope, Pope John, who was very helpful. I used the uh, chairman of the Soviet uh, uh, Republic, uh, the Soviet system, communist system at the time, uh, Gorbachev. I understood his style. He was very uh, uh, particular. He's very compulsive. He was an engineer with a law degree. And I taught Reagan, basically, to stand his ground with some of my CIA colleagues who were there, I, mean, I give credit to the CIA as well, not the ones who are there now, but who had been there 20, 30 years ago, and understood that we were going to trap Gorbachev in the negotiations by continuously creating and repeating a thing called SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, which at that time was a PSYOPs operation. We then increased the budget of the United States through SDI, and that scared the Russians, and then what we did was to take the Supreme Allied Commander of the uh, Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Navy and Army, a man by the name of Akramayev, Admiral Akramayev, who was very bright. Uh, we personally took him on an aircraft carrier to show him how our planes go off the aircraft carrier, how efficient we are, and at the same time how concerned we are about our sailors because uh, the Russian Navy was notorious for allowing the men to die in the submarines, uh, and Akramayev had never seen anything like that, although from spy planes he had seen what we did. Then to make the point that our military was much stronger than the Soviet military, we didn't have to go to war with them, we basically placed uh, five P-72 tanks, which is what they had at the time, and we took a M1 Abrams, which was the tank we had 20 years ago, and in 30 seconds we showed him that the M1 Abrams could decimate the entire T-72. So immediately he understood that his army was defeated. There was no way metal on metal that the Russians could ever confront on World War III the hypothesis or, or realize that hypothesis that they could invade Europe or uh, attack any uh, element of the United States because we would have defeated them. So we had three elements. We took over the religious element that was uh, Pope and we spread that religion through uh, Poland into the Soviet Union reactivated Greek Orthodoxy and Christianity. That broke, uh, that created agitation. We then uh, neutralized the military through a PSYOPs operation, which was basically to take their tanks out. Uh, then we, uh, we forced them to break up their uh, economy through uh, ramming up their budget to meet something called the SDI, which they didn't know what it was. And the fourth thing we did was something that I came to uh, both by proclivity and it shows you my own sense of humor, but my own uh, particular love for American rock and roll. Uh, when I was in the Soviet Union 20 years before that, uh, I found out from many of the dissidents that they loved rock and roll, American rock and roll. And when I saw some of their secret uh, discotheques, I realized that the KGB could not really handle the children because they came out of the nomenclatura. They were very wild and woolly, but they really snuck in a lot of our records, a lot of our blue jeans, 
And so we, uh, through the agency, which did an excellent job at the time, under Richard Helms and, and people who were not there, but got, uh, Gates was uh, a, then a junior officer, uh, they were good people, and, and we were able to really create an agitation at the different levels and create uh, dissension, or what we call agitprop, agitation propaganda. So using psychological operations, using cultural dynamics, understanding psychology, and understanding the use of the military without having to fight, we were able to take down the Soviet Union. Uh, Gorbachev did not give it to us. It did not just inevitably slip. It was not the theories of some uh, conservative ideologue who they claimed. It was not a product of the neocons. It was the product of a very practical president who made a very practical order, and I happen to have been very honored to lead the architecture in that, but it really involved a lot of people who were very talented at the time. Well, Steve, given the fact that, again, Nothing's changed except the occupant of the White House in, in retrospect. What I would, and don't take this wrong, but the old timers that understood national security and that really in some, uh, some definable ways, the best example is one you just gave, they really cared for this country. Now explain to the people the PSYOPs operation going on against them with the, the destruction of the First Amendment rights. I mean, soon the Second Amendment, you're, you've been uh, clued in. I know you have. Uh, I've sent you emails. Well, it goes to, before that. Even it, it goes way beyond the time you and I met, Steve. Uh, I, I have gone on your show, and I've gone on many shows, including Alex Jones' show. Uh, the minute 9-11 came aboard, I mean, I don't want to belabor it again, uh, 9-11 uh, is not what we call a frontal attack by uh, al-Qaeda. What it was, in effect was a stand-down operation. It's a PSYOPs operation where the United States uh, stood down. That means they ordered all their Army, and military, and Air Force to stand down. The biggest culprit here would probably have been the Air Force, NORAD, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Myers, uh, Cheney, Wolfowitz, the neocons. And the reason for it, I said it very clearly then, six years ago, said 9-11. I knew the day after when I was quoted in the Military Intelligence Journal, this is either collusion or incompetence, but certainly uh, it didn't just happen. Uh, I say it was collusion because several of my generals who worked for me in military intelligence literally said to me sheepishly that this was a stand-down. A stand-down means that we have ordered uh, all of our soldiers that came directly from Cheney and Bush. Uh, Bush is not just a puppet. It went through Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice. These are your culprits, and they were never indicted, never investigated, especially by this administration, who's also cowardly. Of course, never assaulted by the Democrats, who are now in power, by many of the congressmen who you see in flaunting themselves. Basically what happened, once 9-11 occurred, there was a PSYOPs operation, which created the denial of distraction so that we could go forth, the president go forth and attack Iraq, which, of course, everybody now knows was lies, and I had said it beforehand. I'm on record. And then eventually to attack Iran, which was, again, not a threat, and using uh, neoconservative uh, who were related and tied to Israel. The theory was between Israel and the United States, they were to conquer uh, the Middle East, they would attack Iran, then eventually Syria, and they would be democracy. Well, it all became for naught. I was on the radio way before that, and then eventually on your show, I said, be careful of the government. It has played a PSYOPs operation. It is milked out and basically uh, 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 parasitically uh, 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 eaten out the flesh and fiber of our own country in order to implement wars that did not need to be uh, uh, exist, that, and it did not have to be uh, in, in, in uh, existence. It, it bled out our country in terms of money, in terms of the men and women who died. Uh, they served our country, these men and women, but I have reprimanded the generals, and there is a severe dereliction of duty among those generals. I think it is a travesty that uh, in the New York Times and elsewhere, the Congress, is a cowardly Congress, says that you cannot criticize our generals, and that's a lie. I will criticize General Petraeus for what he did in Afghanistan. I will criticize General Derno, knowing fully well these men know they do not belong in Afghanistan. Uh, General Petraeus was put in to substitute for Bremer. I was part of that group and working with our own senior generals in military intelligence. I came in as a volunteer. And I will tell you again, there is a dereliction of duty among our military, senior military officers who have to kowtow and want to kowtow to this President of the United States who has never served our country and questionably may not be of our country. But let's get forward. So what has happened? There's a PSYOPs operation which said that we, in effect, have a democracy. 
Well, it's a very hard concept to say that we have a democracy when I go into a food store and as my, senior, as my oldest daughter once said to me, Dad, the United States of America works in self-delusion. We go to a food store, we have 25 different brands of coffee, 30 brands of sugar, and 40 brands of toothpaste. We go to our political system for the presidency and we have two choices. Neither one is very good, but those are the two choices and we claim that's a democracy and the shift in power. Then we go to our health system, we have one choice. So what in fact happened is the PSYOPs operation that I think continued on from the Bush administration on went through the Clintons where they made a deal. They were paid off. No question, Hillary was paid off. She was given Secretary of State, which is a not great position for her. Many millions of hundreds of millions of dollars, I am certain, was given to Hillary Clinton to buy off that election and her debt. And who are the people that give it? Well, they're the supporters. You have the banking industry. You have the military-industrial complex. You have the transnational corporations. This is not a conspiracy. This is not something that I just made up and I'm, gonna, I'm an extremist. I'm a pragmatist. I worked under Baker and Bush. We're not, we're not ideologues. We, we care about national security. Now, why are these different elements so important to the transition of power? Because they have a vested interest in making sure that their power base, i.e., the military-industrial complex, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, L3 Communications, Boeing, all of which really do not add value to our society, and the, and the most nefarious of all is called Blackwater, where Cheney brought in a group of Hessian soldiers, mercenaries, 100,000 of them, despite, in order to, quote, protect our diplomats. Well, if you can't be protected, that's too bad. You want to know the truth? Um, most of our diplomats are not worth the salt they're in, and I can tell you as a Deputy Assistant Secretary, I would have closed down most of the embassies. They're not really very effective because we have virtual diplomacy now on the Internet, but nevertheless, we hired these contract officers, 100,000 mercenaries. That means their loyalty is to the paycheck. I don't care what they were before. It is not the loyalty to our country. So what our country has done is to train our brave men and women and then the mercenaries and men like Christian who were ahead of Blackwater and others, and they now change the name to ZXE because -E, they're cowardly and, and know that they're being reprimanded. And now they're the ones who kill our men who we train and they make profit from it. All right, so their loyalty is not to our country. Now, what makes it even more nefarious? This president, who has no idea of what war is about, has no idea of national security, has surrounded himself with the same cannon fodder that I worked with, Mr. Brzezinski, who was a disaster under the Carter administration, brought us such great things as the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot, which I then had to come in 20 years later to undo and create a treaty in order to prevent them from killing themselves again. Carter, once again, lied to the public. He never talked about the fact that he protected Pol Pot. We have the same gentleman, Brzezinski, and guess who else? Richard Holbrook. Richard Holbrook I personally like, but a man who is vested in creating wars. Why? Because that's how he becomes famous. He has hired an archivist, if anybody's doubted. He hires a, uh, a publicist. And now he's in charge of Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's called... The envoy. Now, the reason he's called an envoy of the mission is because he doesn't need senatorial confirmation. And he couldn't pass a senatorial confirmation because he was with an investment banking firm. Now, Richard doesn't know anything about investment banking. Furthermore, he doesn't really know very much about national security other than what he feels he thinks is right. Richard Holbrook's history goes back to the days of the Phoenix Project. Those of you in the audience who remember in Vietnam, we used to drop people out of the helicopters in interrogation that was part of a nefarious CIA operation, which wasn't too effective. And Richard was in charge as assistant secretary of the Pacific, East Asia and the Pacific, and guess what he did? He was supporting Pol Pot under the directions of Carter. Richard Holbrook protected Pol Pot in Thailand and allowed the Khmer Rouge, after they were being slaughtered by the Vietnamese, our so-called enemy who defeated us already, they were beating the, the hell out of the Khmer Rouge Richard Holbrook, under the orders of Carter, protected Khmer Rouge. Now, that's crime. He was never brought up for those charges. But what he's famous for, and this is the real hook of another psyops, he's famous for, quote, resolving the peace conflict in Bosnia. Well, all he did was to separate Milosevic, who was then the president, and a guy named Karachik, who, by the way, was a psychiatrist like I am. 
But Karacha, quote, escaped. Richard allowed him to escape. And he was picked up about nine months ago in Serbia, working as a naturopathic doctor. And guess what he said? Karacha was absolutely honest, because I know from other sources in the intelligence community, he said, Richard Holbrook allowed me to escape and gave me a, a pension every month for the past ten years and promised I wouldn't be arrested. That's our Richard Holbrook, who's now in Pakistan, now in Afghanistan, claiming that we have to stabilize Pakistan, which is a totally corrupt country and does not exist, because the Taliban's are a threat to us. No, the Taliban's are not a threat to us. The Islamic fundamentalists, whom we had used under the Soviet Union, they're more than happy to stay there where they are, have nothing to do with us, and guess what they do most effectively? They increase opium trade. They claim they decrease it, but they make all kinds of deals on the opium trade. And guess who controls the Taliban's besides the Pakistani ISI, which is the Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, which was created by the CIA, one-third of Afghanistan is controlled by Iran. So we do not belong there. If the President of the United States does not understand this, Mr. Obama, then he's not a very smart man. But I think he is the smart man, and I think he's trying to do what he can. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But I think he will, tell, he will do anything to look good and to make promises as if he were doing something. And in, the, in short, he's ineffectual. His deputy, his national security advisor, is the General Jones, who's a completely ineffectual. He has done nothing. He's a total disappointment now. He's a four-star commandant from the Marine Corps. Most people felt he was a disaster. He still is. He left the Marine Corps and became head of uh, the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, made $900,000. So what we have here is a system of PSYOPs to continue the military-industrial complex, which I feel is a very detrimental element to the United States. And so did Eisenhower. He warned us of men who leave the government and go back into building more weapons systems, like the F-22, which we don't need, the carriers we don't need. I mean, it's just endless perpetration of their own powers. And our generals are making a lot of money, whether they're working for L-3 Communication, Northrop Grumman, Lincoln Road, I can give you a whole list of them, and they refuse to stand up and be counted as individuals and really serve our country. Now, they will be indignant and say, oh, well, but I have served my country, now I want to make money. No, you make money by doing what you have to do in another area, not by prostituting yourself. So that's one. Number two, we have the problem of the mercenaries. And those mercenaries are now spreading out domestically because under the Blackwater label, you have a lot of private security companies in the United States that are, quote, uh, fulfilling the gap or filling the gap where local policemen are not able, police forces are not able to man their own stations, whether it's Charlotte, North Carolina, whether it's in Oakland, California. Police departments have been depleted of their policemen. Guess where they went? They went to the Iraq war. Guess what happens? They're extremely well trained. I work with local police here in Miami and elsewhere. They are very good. For the most part, overall, the local police departments are exceedingly good. The problem is the states claim, and so do the counties, that we can't afford them because they cost us six figures. So instead of having one policeman for 100000 and 120000 who's putting his line or her line on the life, we're going to hire four low-grade, low-quality, TSA type of people who don't even speak English, know nothing about guns, who are certified to use a gun, have no police training whatsoever, and we're going to have four incompetents instead of one competence. So for 100,000, instead of having one policeman, I could have two or three security guards. So there you have the privatization of our internal security as a result of our privatization of our national security, and now we get to the privatization of our intelligence system, which has never been great. The men and women who served with me in national security are all gone and disgusted. They've left. Many of them have used as consultants Iran, Afghanistan, and they're disgusted. I mean, I have one friend who was head of counterintelligence. He said, I can't take it anymore. This is beyond the pale. Why? Because 80% of our intelligence system in the CIA, in the National Security Agency, in the NRO, in the National Geographic Agency, in the Satellite Agency, are all outsourced out to McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed Martin, once again to the military-industrial complex where it's just a revolving chair. And what happens is we get incompetent intelligence because we don't have human intelligence. 
God forbid somebody should go in the field. We don't know how to train them in human because nobody's trained as I was in psychology, national characters, psyops. We claim we have better intelligence, but we appoint a man like Panetta, who really has never had any experience, doesn't know anything about intelligence, is a politician. And in turn, we appoint a, a military admiral, Blair, who's probably a nice guy, but not really all that effectual in intelligence, and then we have a system that really cannot produce anything. We have thousands of analysts and no hard data. But the problem in this whole intelligence system is that 80% do not work for the U.S. government. They work for outsourcing companies. So what happens? You get a candidate who comes into the CIA. He gets trained by the CIA, our government. He leaves that position. Let's say it's whatever is an analyst. He gets hired by SAIC, which is one of the uh, Beltway Bandits, and comes back at three times the same salary in the same position. So we have bloated our government, we have perpetuated incompetence, and we are headed for self-destruction. Now, I've said this a year ago, I said it two years ago, and what happens is the American public hasn't really awoken to this yet. And the reason for it is they believe the ballot is the best way. No, the ballot is not the best way. All the ballot does is to reaffirm a two-party system which is already corrupt and basically voting for people who are never qualified. McCain was not qualified to be president of the United States. I mean, he was a hostage. I trained a lot of hostages, and I worked with hostages. I saved over 500 hostages. And I used to say to my military men, being a hostage is not a hero. Taking hostages you become a hero. So we didn't have viable candidates. Palin was, of course, a jerk. Biden is not very bright. And you got a guy, Obama, whose best efforts was to organize in the streets. So basically you had a PSYOPs machinery that worked on the Internet. Now, what I'm getting to is very simple. Either the audience that you're listening, that's listening here, is going to hear it again. We do not have a democracy. We have a republic. The republic is dysfunctional because the people who are being reelected are bloated, are corrupt, are incompetent, they're lazy. I mean, how many other adjectives would you like me to say? And I'm not coming out of any extreme, be it the right or the left. I'm just telling it to you as a doctor, psychiatrist, as a person who's been operational and who knows many of these congressmen and senators. Believe me, I know them. I've treated them. I've worked with them. And they are people who have never had their own jobs, have never been able to go out like you and I in America, to learn how to manage a mortgage, to learn how to manage a cash flow, to have employees, to build a business. You know why? Because they're scared. Yet if you look at their net worth, this president who makes 160 some odd dollars, let's say 180,000 as a senator, his net worth as a senator was 2.2 million. Now how in God's name did he get the 2.2 million when he's supposed to be a full-time senator? And his net worth went to 2.2. The answer was he wasn't a full-time senator. If you ask anybody in the Senate, he didn't do anything in the Senate, as most people know. Instead, he immediately went and got a book contract that gave him the money. But he's not up for scrutiny. The same thing, you look at Christopher Dodd. Where was the indictment? Why is he making that kind of money? Because he has lobbyists who are coming in the banking system. Max Baucus of Montana is famous for being the harlot of K Street. Everyone of the people on K Street has either worked on the Senate Finance Committee under Max Baucus, that little state of Montana that you and I live in, has had experience with Max Baucus, and Max Baucus's donations, and you can look them up, I don't make it up, come from Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Ron Rubin, Larry Summers, and I remember Max only had to make $6 million for 30 dinners that he had to have before he was even elected, re-again, re-elected again, in Montana. In other words, he's incompetent. He's ineffectual. But the American people decide that's what he wants. So I put the blame back on your audience. That until they say, I'm sick and tired, you go back out into the streets and you make sure that your voices are heard with the placards that I saw in Bozeman, Montana, and the 500 other areas, and you ignore the titles that are given to us, i.e. extremism, right-wing terrorists. There's no right-wing terrorist. The only terrorism you have here is the terrorism of the government, the suppression of liberties, the fact that the FBI once again does what we call an S-1 that they did during Vietnam. They go around, they spy on all the mass meetings, they want to know the names and numbers of the people who attend these meetings so that they can have it on a file. 
In effect, they are a totally ineffectual group. When it came to hostage negotiation and the Hanafi Muslim, they were worthless. They had no snipers. They had no capability. But what the FBI is great at is self-promotion. They are great from the day of that homosexual, that closet homosexual, J. Edgar Hoover, who people knew about, who lived with the man for 30 years, and I have nothing against homosexuals per se, but this was a hypocrite, to the day they are today Mueller, they know that they're ineffectual. And they know that all they can do is collect information on everybody, possibly even me, I hope so, but they can get my name spelled correctly, and they monitor us. That's called an S-1. But in effect, what you saw in that hostage negotiation with the, 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 uh, with the captain on the dinghy, that was pathetic. To have five different gunboats and to have the military all around and to call three snipers a hero, that's not exactly what we were about in America. I had over 156 hostages, no snipers, and we were able to get it out using PSYOPs. So what am I saying in effect? We have, we have continued to go downhill from the days of Clinton, Bush Jr., who was a disaster, to now Obama and Biden, who's as, as stupid as, the, as a man I can find, a man who says to you, in 1929, Franklin Roosevelt gave a speech on the Depression on television. Well, for those who you may not know, people like me know, there was no television in 1929. There was no uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So what you have here are, again, it's a club of wealthy men in the Senate who never earned their, they never earned their keeps by their own medal. They never earned anything on their own. They're totally spoiled. They have their own health care system. So what happens in return is they don't mind putting out all kinds of money to make sure that we don't have our own health care system. Our education system is a disaster. Our military is a disaster because no one's in control. It's totally bloated. Bob Gates said it. Our, our incursions into foreign countries should never have existed. Right now, we have 178 uh, countries and 223 bases all over the United of the world. We don't have that many terrorists. We have two to three bases in Bulgaria, two to three bases in Romania. There are no terrorists there. So the answer is either this army has to get their thing together and start to realize that this can't continue because they've lost every war. And I've said it to our generals: you have lost every war you have been in, from Korea to Vietnam to Panama, which was not a war to Haiti, to Grenada, which was not a war, to the first Iraq war and the second Iraq war, and now Afghanistan. And you should be ashamed of yourself. But instead of standing up to your civilian commanders and telling them, this is not the way you use an M a military force, which is sharp, capable, and to use it at will on the wrong issues of national security, we have destroyed our own army. And this is what Obama is continuing to do. So we're in a very sad state. The economic issue, you have said brilliantly, Steve, where we were. You called the date that it occurred, October 8th. I'll never forget that. And at the same time, you explained how the banks were going under. And the banks will go under. And this economy is a disaster because the banks are run by people who are ineffectual, people who received, who had lobbyists to lobby Max and Christopher Dodd and Barney Frank, who was the first one to give uh, FHA and FDI and, and, uh, and uh, Fannie Mae, all the rights and regulations that they needed to expand their loan and knowing fully well these loans would never be covered. And they said, oh, my God, I didn't know about it. You had Hank Greenberg of AIG corrupt. You had Goldman Sachs corrupt. You have Bank of America that's corrupt. You have Larry Summers who's corrupt, makes $5.1 million dollars of which 4.8 is given to him by a hedge fund while he's the head of the Economic Council and receives $135,000 in speeches to Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, uh, J.P. Morgan at our expense and money. All right, so the egregious amount of corruption, ineffectualness, and suppression of liberties is where we are now. And now I'm saying to the American public and to your listeners, what do you want to do? If you want to sit home, then don't complain. If you've come out to do what you did at the Tea Party, although I would like to call this something else because I don't think it's a Tea Party and a protest, that's the beginning of it. But you're going to have to do a lot more than you've been doing because the economy and this country is going into the toilet. 
This is the end of Pax Americana. The Chinese know it. India knows it. Other countries around the world. So you have neither safety. You have neither national security. You don't have a health system. You don't have a military system. You don't have an intelligence system. You don't have an education system. In short, the social contract has been broken by de facto, by the governments, Bush, Clinton, Obama, it didn't matter. By increased power, decreased services, and the individuals suppressed by the dominance of the federal power. Hey, Steve. This is where the Steve. American public has to come for it. Let me ask you this. Let me take it now into what's going on right now, and I want to ask you some questions, okay? Mm -hmm. People who have been, and, and uh, from a psychological operation, and by the way, Henry Kissinger is on record as stating, you know, I'm just getting emails, uh, you know, your, your, your guest uh, he, uh, thinks Kissinger is a good guy. Kissinger just stated that. I didn't that, say he was a good guy. I know. I, I worked for Henry Kissinger. I didn't say he was a good guy. Right. I didn't get along with him personally. Right. But the deal is, is he just is on record as saying that by September, all private firearms in America will be gone, okay? That's, well, let me put it this way. Henry Kissinger likes to shoot his mouth off on a lot of things. He's not a man of great uh, valor. He's not a man who's of great integrity or great honesty. I didn't work for him because I liked him. I didn't, as a matter of fact, I didn't. I was against the war, and I was put in a special position where I didn't have to interact with him personally or professionally because I didn't agree with him, and I found him, quite frankly, to be a coward, to be a liar, and, and probably a war criminal. He and McNamara, because they lied about the Gulf of Tonkin, they lied about the whole issue of Vietnam. So let's get that straight. I, I have no loyalty to Kissinger. Thank I you. I worked for the administration because I wanted to get Nixon out, and he was under when he was in trouble. At the same time, to try to pull out soldiers out of Vietnam, what we call E and E, because it was a bad war, as most of these wars were. So when Kissinger says they're going to take our guns away, you know. You have to look at it with a grain of salt, but the real issue is if they're going to suppress, they, the government, are going to suppress our rights to the gun. I'm a Second Amendment person, but at the same time, I'm pragmatic. So if I'm being told that guns are being shipped in from the United States into Mexico because there's a drug cartel war going on, which there is, then I want to know where in God's name is it say is anybody mentioning the fact that the number one shipper of guns, ammunition, I'm not talking about nuclear weapons, I'm talking about tactical ammo, regular AK-47s, is the number one manufacturer and shipper around the world is the United States government. The number two is China. The number three is Russia. Number four is France. And number five is England. Now, if you listen to what I just told you, who are the members of the Perm Five at the UN? United States, China, France, England, and Russia. Isn't that a little bizarre? Well, it's predictable, Steve, and we all know that, that the idea is, is that the, the power base is a financial base. But here's what I want you to address, too. The idea, okay, now look, I had... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel in my office from NORTHCOM, okay? Mm -hmm. And I know his name, and those of you can, you know, go right. drown yourselves to, you know, here's the thing, it's amazing. Everybody believes the mainstream media, and they always use anonymous sources, but when we get people that basically uh, uh, would be liquidated immediately telling stuff, somehow all the paid shills on all the different boards say, oh, those guys are just, you know, crazy. But here's, here's what I want to address, okay? Yeah. The idea is, and I have been told this, and others have been told this, that specifically that the Obama administration prior to the inauguration was spending 80% of its time on figuring out how to take away the weapons. Okay, now listen, yeah. people think that they have First Amendment rights. Well, we're seeing all sorts of the overstepping, and, and I've been told this, I've been told this by, by the, the people that are absolutely bound and determined to destroy this country, and in my opinion, they've effectively neutralized the Constitution, because most people don't even know what the Constitution is about, but the fact is, is that it is their design, their desire, and their implementation goal. It's their a priori uh, emphasis right now to disarm the American population. Good example, Obama just passed a law, or Obama just proposed a law that basically reloading is going to be illegal. Somebody said that Obama should be uh, the gun salesman of the year because, as you're aware, since he yeah. came, yes, he came into 
uh, office. Yeah. Every every firearm that's a black gun, that means a semi-automatic, every pretty much a round down to 22 has been bought up. So let me share this. You and I have been on the radio for a couple of years now right. talking about this day. And, again, the thing that, I, you know, I'm accused of overreacting, okay? Now, you know me pretty well, and you know my sources. And for the record, I'm going to state this. I don't ask Steve his names of your sources, do I? No. Nor do you ask me my sources. No. But when we get multiple verifications through our independent uh, sources, and they, they basically are almost global in their reach and where they are, then we know that something's up, correct? That's correct. I mean, they, we'll give the classical example of that rocket. I mean, right. We, but would you would you please address that because I am so sick of you know being told I'm full of you know what. And and well, I say it, this, it, look, it, I, it's not I, that I'm defensive. I think defensive. your audience should know. Was it about a year ago? Yeah. It was during the summer, and and I live in about three miles away from uh, Steve, and and we are friendly and we do discuss things, but we don't always agree. So that I think the audience has to understand that. Yeah, and we but don't. Independent of Steve, I, I was uh, in my backyard, and suddenly out of nowhere, I saw a plume, a trail going up of a rocket in Bozeman, Montana. Now we don't have an installation there. This had to have been a portable rocket. This had to have been a rocket that was ad hoc placed in a, in a place, and I looked at it, and the plume stood there for about 60 seconds or 90 seconds, and I said, good God, what's this about? So I happened to have met Steve the next day, and I said, Steve, you won't believe this, but I just saw a trail of a rocket. I mean, it's not a jet plane. I know a fighter jet, and I know what a local jet. This is straight up, perpendicular to the ground. And lo and behold, what did Steve tell me? You tell me. Well, I, my, a friend of mine, one of my clients and I were coming back from Livingston, Montana, which is east of Bozeman, looking to the west, actually west-northwest, and where you live, and I won't give details, right. but it would have been north of you. Right. And the thing is, I said, Steve, this is amazing, because we actually saw something right. uh, that was basically hidden at one point, explodes, and then where we were at, because of this, the sun's altitude, or actually the attitude of the sun, the angle of the sun, it was a kind of like a red mist, and and my friend who was with me, a very wise and and uh, uh, how should I say this, well placed uh, woman for the record, was basically convinced we we're at World War Three. I then got on the phone to Hawk, my co-host, and I asked him. I said, "Are you guys picking up anything?" in the uh, communications realm. He said, yeah, there's a lot of chatter. So while I'm watching this and you're watching this, but from separate locations, never having compared stories, we're getting all this chatter that basically the emergency action messages are going out. So somebody blew up something out of the air. And, and Steve, a couple of weeks after that, and I got my share of, you know, you're insane, all this stuff, but even on Larry King. They had somebody had taken a video of that and claimed, and I'm not saying this, but claimed that we and some of our basically top secret stuff had launched a missile against a UFO. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying yeah, is, yeah. you and I both saw it independently. Yeah, the there, same was a missile, there was a missile trip. But let's get back to the key point of guns being taken away. That's right. not going to happen. I mean, okay, and I would fight it. I would encourage the United States, the citizens of this country, to fight it. That is our Second Amendment. Uh, there is no rash, uh, a rationalization or excuse to take away those guns. Uh, the people I know in Montana and elsewhere who have guns, they use it for hunting. They don't go around. We have licenses in Montana. I don't see anybody carrying guns in the town. Uh, those who have trained for guns, no guns, are very effective in not using it when they don't have to. Those who want to use a gun and are crazy and will use it, they'll use it anyway. So I can't prevent somebody from taking a gun and shooting everybody. That's not going to happen. Nor am I a believer that you need an AK-47 to hunt a deer. In between the two, however, the right to bear arms in the United States is essential. If Obama thinks or his minions think that in any way, particularly Eric Holder, thinks, he's the Attorney General, that he can take away guns or numerate the number of guns that will be out there and then make sure that they don't appear or you have to hand them back in, that's going to be a big mistake. I would be happy to confront them on, on a level which we would add up to violence. And I'm not against violence. I, th I, I think what's important for the audience to understand is, even though I've been in psychological operations, I have also been 
in operational levels where we have used violence to neutralize different elements. Now, I have said it repeatedly. I've said it on this show. I've said it on other shows. I have served my country eight times. I have been willing to die eight times for my country. And I have not gotten a pension, so I want everybody to know, nor do I work for a, uh, uh, a military-industrial complex. I have to work for myself. I have no problem going into the streets and acting in a violent way if my freedoms will be suppressed. If he continues with the, uh, the uh, Patriots game, uh, Act, if he continues with suppressing our right to bear arms, if he continues to make sure that we cannot have protests in the streets, as I saw there in Bozeman and elsewhere, then Obama will be confronted with what I suspect has been long coming, and that is his false expectations, his betrayal, his deceit, and his, his grandiose promises, and this incredible arrogance that he shows he will be met with violence to the American public. I do not think it's an accident that the governor of Texas, correct my his name, I don't remember, said very clearly that we should secede from the Union. Having said that, I make no apologies for saying that. The United States of America may not remain a republic, and perhaps should not. I am not a great believer that the aggrandizement of federal power is in the best interest of the individual or the citizen. I am a great believer of what I wrote 10 years ago in a book called State of Emergency, where the local government in Nye County, Nevada, confronted the federal government over water rights, and it was literally guns to guns. This is not something I made up. And I predicted 12, 13 years ago there would be an impending second civil war. Now, whether it's over guns, whether it's over illegal immigrants, whether it's over suppression of liberties, whether it's over joblessness, or an economy that he cannot fix, and I can assure you this will not be fixed, whether it's other unemployment, I predict there will be violence in the street, as there should be. Now, am I treasonous? Yes. Is that the first time I'm treasonous? No. I believe that in an age of tyranny, that an individual who is treasonous must be able to be called a patriot. And I've said that to Bush when I said, your brother... And your son is a disaster. I will work against him with the military to make sure he will have no power over our military, which he didn't. But I will be treasonous. In that, in the name of tyranny, as a treasonous, as a treasonous individual, I consider myself a patriot. And that's the way I think your audience should understand that. Right. I'm not blithe about it. I'm not complacent. I'm not happy to say that. But unfortunately, the American public has gotten fat. Lazy, disinterested, uninterested. They're being fed pablum on CNN and Larry King and all that nonsense. And at the same time, the papers are worthless. So you're going to have to be able to look at information, call it out, listen to Steve Quayle, question him, question me. I don't believe that everything I say should be taken at heart. I don't believe I say the truth or Steve says the truth. But we bring to you a very convincing perspective. And by the way, it was Steve who predicted on October 8th we would have a bank bailout. And it happened on October 8th. It was I who predicted we would have this 9-11, then we would have another false flag operation, and that we would go into Iraq, we would try to look for a war in Iran through Israel, and that we would go into Afghanistan, none of which has anything to do with our national security. Steve, here's a good question. I'm curious as his background as a PSYOP expert as to what you think would be, meaning you, Steve, would be the most effective form of prote uh, protesting for the public. Clearly, he believes the election process is hopelessly corrupt. I agree. And that we need to do much more than the Tea Party. At the same time, the powers that be are probably waiting for an overly aggressive event on behalf of an aggrieved public to declare us terrorists and bring about martial law. By the way, I want you to address that, too. So let's, let's deal with the first thing. What, in your opinion, is going to be effective? Because you and I have talked at length about the coming civil war. There yeah. will be a civil war. The balkanization of the United States. Let there be no... Uh, we are in agreement on that yeah. point. But the point is, okay, so this gentleman, uh, Chris, is asking, what's the best thing? A boycott of the dollar? A national work strike? Well, I think it's a combination of the boycott of the dollar, taking dollars out of the banks. I've said it a long time ago. I think the banks are nothing more than repositories of uh, social welfare. 
I mean, bankers have never shown or demonstrated an ability to be really value-added. By the way, I've owned several banks, and I've gotten rid of them. But banks in and of itself just loans money from the feds at a very low rate and, and leases it out. And basically, they don't really take any risk. And they're really basically intermediaries that have very little value. So you take the money out of your banks. If you want gold, you buy gold. Uh, it's up to you. Number two, you demonstrate in the streets. You demonstrate until there is confrontation and violence. You demonstrate until there is blood in the street. And that the media will see it. The president of the United States, this president, is not a man who has the ability to fulfill his promises or complete anything he's ever done. His history is abominable. In Chicago, he had 128 votes that he said that he wasn't present. What he is, what his profile shows is he's a man who will promise you everything, deliver very little, has very poor judgment in appointments, has very limited access, but has a great ability to promote himself, but wants to be liked. Like Bill Clinton, I think they're both, including Bush, are sociopaths. That means they have no conscience, no guilt, no sense of shame, and that they can say anything they want without being accountable or responsible. He's had no work whatsoever that showed him to be a mature individual that he made for himself, including his books, including the fact he wasn't even a senator. When that means, and translated is, that the day will come where there will be bloodshed in the street. And by the way, that won't be just white, white on white, or white on black. It will be blacks who will protest also. Because his ability to mobilize the public and not be able to deliver what he says, and I can guarantee you, he will not be able to deliver. We do not have the money. The banks will not be able to loan that. We do not have the manufacturing base. We have not gotten to the source of the problem, the real estate. We have not gotten to the source of jobs. But we have been giving a lot of people jobs at TSA, who don't belong there, FBI, and all kinds of ridiculous security apparatuses that really have no relevance other than to give them useless jobs and feather bedding. Now what we have is a real confrontational mode. And I predict that this may be the summer of rage here in the United States and certainly in Eastern Europe and certainly in China, and certainly in Africa and in, in other places in South Africa and South Asia, Pakistan. So what we're going to see here is going to mirror or be mirrored by countries all over the world. There will be bloodshed in the streets. There will be young people who will die because they have no jobs, they have no food, they have nothing left. Yesterday here in Miami, a man jumped out of the building because he had economic trouble. Suicide after suicide. Families being killed by individuals who see no upside. And what I'm saying is, that's an easy way out. The harder way out is to say, you know what? I'm going to fight for what I want and what they owe me. And they owe it to you. You are the American citizen. They are your servants. We are not their servants. So I see confrontation. I okay. think it's the only way to, to lance the boil of hypocrisy, deceit, and betrayal. Right now, as you that, are, I will go to jail. You yep, know that. Yeah, but listen to this. Right now, as to the summer of rage, or basically uh, linguistics even is calling a summer from hell, General Motors has announced today that they're going to close most factories for the summer, okay? Everybody I talk to, and again, ladies and gentlemen, I've said this before. You don't believe what I say? Fine. Those of you that will believe it and those of you that, uh, you know, are listening to Dr. Pachinik today, General Motor to close most factories for summer. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, oh, good night, uh, uh, tobacco producers is closing one of their biggest. Everybody, it seems like, that's in the corp gov, in other words, the very thing that you're talking about, knows and is getting ready. Can you imagine, Steve, multi-millions of people that are absolutely turned loose onto the streets because they can't pay their mortgages. And by the way, I was one of the guys a long time ago, I'm not blowing my own horn, but setting the record straight. When people didn't know what a derivative was 15 years ago, I was defining it for them. When people didn't know that there'd be ammo shortages, I said there would be. All I'm trying to t say to everybody is this, and I believe that based on the intelligence I have and the sources of the intelligence dependable in the past, that obviously the government knows this summer is going to be a summer from hell, and that's why all the martial law em emphasis, the uh, big FEMA exercise that's coming up on the 26th of July for a week, and, and i got to tell you, 
there were times when even the senators came up and and congressmen came on the floor and said, you know, we were threatened by Goldman Sachs's former president, i.e., Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, that if we didn't go along with the bailout, they'd put us under martial law. So, you know, I, I think that people need to understand this and the. Factors are building up to an explosion this summer, in my opinion. I want all our listeners to be out of harm's way when that happens. Well, I don't know if they, well, that's where you and I differ. I don't want them to be in the harm's way. I want them to be in harm, to be part of that. Otherwise, you can no longer say you really are an American citizen. I'm not asking you to die for our country. I am asking you to fight for it. Oh, absolutely. But now, when I say that, let me share this, what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. I am telling everybody that, in essence, they do everything they can do, but when push comes to shove, and it's on the front page of my website, you'll know then that all the arguments or all your silence don't uh, get the bill done. And, again, the the situation I think is really disturbing, as, as you were probably aware, the current occupant of the White House is... Now talking about sending a hundred thousand men to Afghanistan, okay? Forgive me, but where are we going to get a hundred thousand men to go to Afghanistan? Mercenaries, primarily in contract. Once again, I mean, there is no war in Afghanistan. We do not need to be there. This will be Vietnam redux again. In other words, we will see Vietnam all over again. Uh, the generals, if they don't stand firm, Petraeus, Adarno, I'm mentioning all of them, Jim Jones, you will be derelict. There is a derelict of command. There is a derelict of decision. I talk to you, the special forces units out there, the intelligence operatives. You know what I'm saying, that you do not follow the orders of a civilian who is not qualified to determine what our national security interests are. The President of the United States is not qualified. Richard Holbrook is not qualified. Hillary Clinton is not qualified. Neither, None of them have ever served in the military. None of them know anything about force structure or national security requirements. But I will say this. You will not get away once again, like in Vietnam and in the Iraq War and Grenada. I warn your generals again and again, if you do not step forward and you, ha- and per- and you do not protest, as you, some had done under Bush, the Iraq occupation, the, the, the onslaught, you will be culpable. And the American public will not forget it. And this law saying that you can't criticize a general is absolutely unconstitutional and absurd. You don't get to be a general unless you're a politician. But the men and the women who fight in our country deserve more than this. And the American public deserves more than our politicians and the republic that's now there. I belong, I believe, and I say it again, what Thomas Jefferson said, every generation must fight for its own democracy in its own way. If we do not do that now, we will be totally suppressed. And the issue here now is that uh, the American public has to decide that the government cannot give them the jobs they have or want. They will not be able to give them the money. There is no money. The money is being made up. It's virtual money, as Steve may have said to you before. If these are numbers on a computer that go back and forth, as Hank Greenberg, the ultimate crook, who was also the head of AIG, was the head of AIG, said, we don't even know where the money went. That was $189 billion. Another $490 billion went into the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. We don't know where the money went. You do not build a civil society with an army. You do not stop people who've been fighting for 5,000 years in the hills of Afghanistan, and I've been in Afghanistan, with poor soldiers who are at the bottom of the hill, unequipped, unable to do anything, with so-called high technology, which means nothing to an Afghani who's been there. He and his, and his family have been there for over 5,000 years. So we do not belong there, and therefore the money belongs back here at home. I do not see a positive outlook, uh, Steve, and that's why I go on your show and I reiterate it. But also, I've lost faith in the American public. I've lost faith because the Republicans have a total disaster. Uh, they put forth this idiot, Palin. Uh, McCain was not qualified. The Republican Party has no semblance to anything I know, which was coming out of Eisenhower, Nixon, Reagan, even Bush Sr. It had an ex- uh, values that we do not commit ourselves to overseas. We have strong national security without having to go in into forays. We have a strong intelligence. We do not get involved. 
into the uh, back pocket or the bedroom of our, our citizens. Hey, Steve. And unfortunately, they have defaulted. The Steve. Democrats are a disaster. Yep, Steve, listen, i got to stop you. We've got to take our break to go into the second hour so they can gotcha. change over satellites. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Q-Files. We'll be right back immediately after station identification. Back, ladies and gentlemen, to the second hour of the Q-Files. This is a live broadcast, 422-09. With me is Dr. Steve Pachinik. Now, hey, Steve, let me ask you this. Somebody wants, and I'm reading you some emails because, I, 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 you know, you made a statement he's not qualified, but do you believe Obama was born in the USA? Hello? Yeah, are you there, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the question is, did you hear me, is do you believe that Obama was born in the USA? Uh, I think there are real serious questions as to whether he was. I okay. Don't, I think there should have been a due diligence process. I think there were enough questions related to that. But I think he, uh, like everything else, he slip-slided through. I think the system, the system being the transnational corporations, Wall Street, uh, CFR, even though I belong to the CFR, I will deactivate a Council on Foreign Relations, all of those who are in Washington and belong to Washington, uh, they decided that this is who they wanted. Uh, whether he was born, I, I have my own doubts. Well, so if you're in the military, and, and I want to make it clear, you teach or have taught extensively at the U.S. Army. Yeah, yeah. I teach at the War College. Every year I go to Fort McNair at ICAF and the War Colleges. I teach strategy, tactics, psychological operation, counterintelligence, uh, psyops. And I must say, the quality of the students has decreased every year. Very what about the generals? Decreased. Generals, colonels, captains, it really is not very good. Our okay. war colleges have not met up to the standards. And instead, what's happening, they've been co-opted by, uh, or they feel what's more important is technology and, uh, you know, looking up in space. And that really isn't very helpful. A satellite of my license plate or my enemy's license plate, I remember some... One of my intelligence operatives came to me, and I was dealing with Kim Jong-il, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of East Asia, and they came to me with a picture of a satellite of my uh, of uh, Kim Jong-il's license plate. And I turned to them and I said, "Boy, is that impressive! Can you tell me what the satellite, what the license plate is thinking about Kim Jong-il and what his decisions are?" So it was really worthless. Uh, we have spent millions and billions of dollars, particularly the National Security Agency, picking up all kinds of information that's worthless. $500 million was wasted because it's like an electronic suction pump. Uh, we have wasted money at the National Reconnaissance Office. We have met wasted money at the National Security Agency. We have wasted money certainly at the CIA. We've wasted money at the DIA, Defense Intelligence. And I would say we waste a lot of money at our war colleges, uh, Annapolis, uh, at, at Gettysburg, uh, elsewhere. I think our people are not trained effectively. They do not understand war. They do not understand how to manipulate and do psychological operation national character. There is one exception, and that is the uh, Marine Corps brought in anthropologists in the Iraq War and realized that some of the skills that I had, which was transferable to anthropologists and dealing with local culture, national character, uh, saved many Marine lives. So the, the bright spot in all of this was really more the Marine Corps than anybody else. And ironically, they were always considered the least capable in terms of intelligence, and now I find them to be the most capable. Where we're at now in the whole course of situations uh, with the Chinese basically owning us financially with the technology that's been transferred, let me give you an anecdote, and I want you to respond some of the intel guys I know who are deep, uh, still active, were talking to some of the Russian counterparts. And the Russian counterparts were wishing for the old days because the quality of the intelligence agents in America, basically they said in their way, and you speak Russian, so you could yes. say it in Russian, is so pathetic it's no fun anymore. That's correct. Uh, they, <laughs> there's a certain irony. I mean, I, I think the audience should have a little snicker at that. Uh, the intelligence days was not like uh, James Bond, but there were our, our operatives who really came out of national security. And if you see a film like The uh, Good Shepherd, or I think that's a pretty accurate picture of uh, James Jesus Angleton, uh, it's a little boring, but it's a good picture of how guys from the OSS, the Overseas uh, Strategic Services, were recruited by Wild Bill Downs into uh, the CIA. And these were pretty much men and women who were dedicated to our country, to our lives, and to protecting us. Now, 
Some of the spies, most people would be surprised. I used to give a lecture on who the spies were. For example, at Julia Childs, who was a very famous operative who controlled uh, and ran a man by the name of Ho Chi Minh. And she was in Vietnam during World War II. So before she was a famous cook, that was one of them. One of our most famous spies is a uh, was a famous actor by the name of David Niven. And he didn't want to reveal that till 1986, till after he died. And, and the reason why he was famous is because he was trained at Sandhurst, and he offered his services to the United States Army. And because he spoke fluent German and looked like a German officer, they would fly him behind the lines to distract the uh, officers in the Luftwaffe. And then one of my operatives, uh, who I ran, uh, ran another operative agent by the name of Greta Garbo, who ran into Sweden. So in the World War II days, in the way when our national security was threatened, and it really was involving the men and women of our country, Everybody came forth. But now you can ask the young kids, even in Montana and elsewhere, uh, do you want to join the Army? Oh, no, 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 no. It's too dangerous. Uh, I can get hurt, you know. And all these kids are all muscle pumpers, and they, they uh, you know, they love to be macho. But when it comes to national service, they really are quite deficient. Uh, I've asked some of the recruiters in, in Montana, you know, how many recruits do you get out of 1,000 people? He said two. And the Border Patrol also said, uh, we only get two out of 1,000. Uh, who even finished six months. So the other issue that has to be important is we cannot have a national consciousness if you want to continue the United States of America without having national service. National service does not mean you have to join the Army. You don't have to go overseas and kill. It means that you join our country and you give two years of your life to services here, whether it's in the ghetto, whether it's in the farmlands, whatever it is. But you can't uh, get away from that. And without national service, our children have become spoiled. I see that in many families. Uh, they've been entitled. They've been lazy. And uh, they've gotten into drugs and all. And I'm not just talking as an older man saying, oh, my God, you know, this is an older man. I just see it repeatedly. And even in Montana, where supposedly everybody's independent. But I see it everywhere. The kids are too interested in drugs. MTV, the Internet, and they have really no sense of national security or where we belong. As a result, let me get back to China, because I've worked with the Chinese all the way to the days of Deng Xiaoping, uh, right after Mao Zedong, and I worked with the Chinese to uh, force them to stop the Khmer Rouge. I've also worked with their intelligence system, warning them that if they once asked me when I came back in China two, three years ago, this is a true story, and I ended up in the Central Committee, although I was doing business in China. The first question the uh, Central Committee intelligence operators were asking me, are you here to take down China? And, of course, as a businessman and a, and a visitor, I said no. But, I, but, but that was a disingenuous answer because it was obvious to me how I could take down this country. And right now China is so weak that the issue of stability is, is the key issue. But let me go back to China because there are enemies. Uh, when I asked my soldiers, and I gave the speech only a few months ago at, at uh, the War College, I asked them, who, who is our next enemy in the five years? And everybody ra rose, raised their hand, and it was uh, China, China. And then I asked for the force structure, how would you build it? And many of the men uh, correctly said, oh, we're going to have an aircraft carrier, littoral ships, uh, we have F-22s, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at my watch, and the bill they ran up was about $400 billion dollars, for an army that's a low-tech army. The Chinese have purposely built a low-tech army so that we cannot interfere with the high-tech, but they can interfere with our own high-tech, as you have seen Internet uh, warfare, cyber warfare coming out of China. So I said, gentlemen, you just lost the war. Uh, the war that China's waging right now is not metal on metal. It's not tank versus tank. It's not aircraft carrier versus aircraft carrier. It is what we call economic warfare. And since we do not have that concept in our own minds, you have to understand the Chinese have bought up all the commodities around the world. They have basically made us hostage to very cheap labor and very cheap products. Witness Walmart, uh, which is really an outlet of China, and the profits that they have that put into T-bills, which they can then manipulate against our national security. So... That's one element of the economic warfare. They're everywhere. I mean, I was in Tehran. I woke up in the morning. There were Chinese engineers who were building a subway. Our own intelligence system didn't know that. They're in Latin America. They were in South Africa, where I was. They were everywhere. And they're very effective in what they do. They penetrate uh, many, many 
elements of a society. So here, the second element besides the economic warfare is the intelligence warfare the Chinese are, are, are waging against us, and that is they have what are called false drops or false companies or false flag operations where they look at economics or they bring teachers over or they bring non governmental organizations, and they have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of students coming over here, all in the guise of learning something from us, and literally taking it back to China. Well, most of these people are intelligence operatives. Not the way we think of them, but they do report to China. They do bring back the information, and China has no qualms about stealing that information. So the Chinese are effectively at war with us, but we don't say that. They have an economic warfare, but our military is not prepared because they think it's going to be a metal on metal. Well, it's not. They basically are cramming down our economic system, and we have no way to retaliate. The second one who's clearly defying some of our interests is Russia. <laughs> Even though I was involved in the takedown of the Soviet Union, I had to, modestly or immodestly, look around when I came back to Russia a couple of years ago and realize I don't know what I really had done. Even though I had taken down the Soviet Union, I had created another system where another <coughs> excuse me, totalitarian leader came forth, and by the way, his name was Putin. At that time, I was in Lubyanka prison looking at my own uh, a dossier. Lubyanka is where the KGB is. And I asked some of the KGB operatives whom I knew, uh, what do you think of Putin? And they said, he's KGB, KGB forever. And they didn't really like him because they were Moscow KGB and he was from St. Petersburg. But what's important to understand about Putin is he's very, very smart. He was not trained just in Russia. He was trained by the greatest spy master of all, a man named Marcus Wolf. Uh, that name may not mean very much to you in the audience, but if you remember the spy who came in from the cold, uh, Jean Le Carré's movie, that was about Marcus Wolf. He was the only one to penetrate American intelligence, German intelligence, French and did it very effectively with what's called the Romeo uh, uh, scenario, where he used handsome men to seduce women. It's the reverse of a uh, honey trap, for those of you who understand that. But he ran officially 100,000 Stasi agents, Stasi being East Germany. When we took down East Germany, suddenly the Stasi agents disappeared. Well, they're working with Hamas now, Hezbollah. They're all over the world as mercenaries, even in our own corps at Blackwater and elsewhere. So we have very sophisticated opponents who are out there, and we really have no discussion of what are national security interests. I can assure you it is not Afghanistan, it is not Pakistan, it's not even Iran, and it's not Israel. As much as Israel is in the news about Hamas or Hezbollah, it's not really relevant to our national security interests. Our national security interest has to state, where do we want to be five years from now economically, where do we want to be politically, and where do we want to be in terms of the general welfare of our public. And we have not stated that, and Obama does not know how to state it. Obama, however, will make a speech. It was announced in the New York Times a few days ago. I don't know if you saw this, Steve, where he's going to redefine the new capitalism of America. Now, I'm going to give you $100, but you already have 100 uh, to figure out what kind of speech that will be and what will be the format of this new capitalism because already they hinted it will be a redistribution of wealth. All right. So one, the, once the crisis is over, in his mind, he's going to give a speech to the American public and the world as to what this new capitalism will look like. I, I didn't make this up. What do you think, that, Steve? Well, I think the bottom line is, is that he's going to stay uh, true to the internationalists that basically run him, that put up the money for him, and the redistribution of wealth, I, I say this is going to be a socialist nightmare on steroids. And by the way, I want to clear up something, Steve. My listeners have all been trained on who Marcus Wolf was. And as you may be aware, our very own Department of Homeland Security and other agencies hired both he, well, he was alive, he's dead now, and Gennady Primakov, okay? Oh, that's right. I forgot you. Told yeah. Me now, that. listen. Yeah. Let me share this with the people, just to put things into perspective. So they people, remember this. Yeah. Well, people need to know this. And Primakov ran the Russian intelligence in Iraq prior to its invasion. Actually, he was over the head of uh, all Middle, Middle East. And Correct. Basically, Steve, in talking to me, I just want to I want to get this out. Based on what I share with you. You're a psychologist. Uh, excuse me, psychiatrist. I apologize for that. No, but 20 it's a, years more of medical education. Yeah. So I have but the deal is, the deal <laughs> is, when you and I check sources, yeah. have, have I given you anything 
that you were not able to independently verify the one the information that you verified. No. No. And and again, so when I talk about sitting down with Russians and we've thrown names around, whether it's a head of uh, Eastern Europe's KGB and the the man was married to uh, Yuri Andropov's daughter. I mean, I spent a thousand bucks guy buying that guy barbecued shrimp, and uh, know, he's drinking that. vodka. And I, I know Primakov. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to. You know, I can corroborate. Primakov's real name was Finkelstein, he's a Jewish guy who hid his origins because in the communist system, even though many of the Jews started the communist system, they were not very popular under Stalin or Khrushchev or Andropov. Uh, his, he's changed his name to Primakov. He received, I can tell you, about $350 million as the control officer for Saddam Hussein. So Saddam paid him uh, quite a lot of money. I was I was in Reno when the director of CIA called a certain individual that I was having lunch. He actually was a consultant that worked for me, okay? Yeah. And then the former head of the FBI got it. They didn't have a clue to show you how bad human intelligence or human was, okay? They didn't have a clue who Primakov was. It just so happened the man I was with was one of his former partners in their association with Gazprom, okay? Yeah. And I was there. I listened to the conversation, okay? He held the phone up, and obviously uh, the interesting thing was that he just smiled. He says, I guess they need this old Texan to teach him what the world's really like. I say that only to say this, that Primakov made the statement that how can the Americans be so foolish to fight and spend all their dollars fighting us during the Cold War, and yet hire us now as some of the highest paid consultants in the world to put internal controls on their people. He was actually laughing about it. Well, I know, but the point is what you said is correct. We have no longer been in a society where nationalism or a sense of pride of your country is what I said to you. It's become a fiduciary element. In other words, everything is fungible. Loyalty is fungible, i.e., witness the uh, uh, Blackwater or the Z guys now. Uh, health is fungible. You know, we can hire doctors at will and pay them extra. <coughs> Education is fungible. Water is fungible. Soon air will be fungible. We have CO2. And so life is fungible. And what happened is we've lost our core values of nationalism. What is our national security? And instead we've, we've, uh, fungi- we've, we've, we've commoditized every, every value and every attitude. So I'm not surprised. There is only loyalty to the dollar. The ruble, the yen. And, and right now, the financial collapse. And here's a question that, that I want to ask you. Based on all of our obvious, uh, you know, conversations, it's playing out exactly. The Chinese, getting back to the Chinese and the Russians, they're very sophisticated commodity traders. In the last week to two weeks, uh, people that live in Beijing contact me, okay? Also, Hong Kong. Does it surprise you that the majority of TARP money is flowing through the Far East to be transferred from a form of a uh, uh, federal debt into tangible commodities? In other words, there are people who can literally look out over the storage yards in China and seeing mounds of manganese, mounds of copper. I mean, I'm talking about as far as your eye can see. No, because, look, if you think about the notion, what does AIG really do, American International Group? Number one, AIG was started about 100 years ago. Uh, it was selling dental insurance all over the world. Uh, and basically, it was a group that provided, and I, I'm not giving you any secrets here, in my opinion, it provided cover for the CIA because it was in so many countries. But when you look at its own operations, it had derivatives, as you've explained to your, your, your audience, that basically went, they had a unit in London that went into collusion with J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs to create the derivatives and insurance policies that were non-existent against subprime loans that they knew would falter. So basically you had two entities, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, selling junk to the public, which they knew would falter, and at the same time they went to AIG and they said to one of their, to their major traders, we'll give you $300 million, which was their bonus fee, for giving us so-called insurance, which, by the way, we'll never call in. And that's how the whole system works. So when you say to me, am I surprised? No. What I am surprised about is that the American public has not done anything. And what I am surprised is that 
I, I, I said, you know, you and I have discussed this repeatedly. I don't know how many times we want to go on the air anymore. Because well, I don't. I, I, I would be blunt. And ladies and gentlemen, I, Steve and I talked about it. And just so you know, this is most likely, is, is this a fair statement, an honest statement, that we won't do another interview together because we both are saying it's no longer worth it? It's not worth it. No, yep. I, and the reason I go back on is because I have such great respect for you and your audience. But the truth is, you know, I, I have no problem risking my life <clears throat> putting it on the line, but I have a great problem when uh, people say, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, it's much bigger than I am, blah, 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 I'm absolving my responsibility, you know, I have my family to take of, care of. Well, if that were the case, unfortunately, we all have those concerns, but the reality, nothing will change, and that's what they're really, uh, the, 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 uh, the congressmen, the senators, this little club of, of incestuous parasites, I mean, they're total parasites, we're totally unable to live in any other environment, will take over. And then you will see uh, the price of, of uh, being inactive and rationalization. One of the things that I, as a psychiatrist, that I've always underestimated, but I've always propagated as a notion that people should think about is that we rationalize our behaviors too often, more so than people realize, and we have excuses for everything. We don't want to do this, we don't want to do that. I mean, what was very clear and why I remembered you went off the air and I, I was disgusted was that you predicted that literally the day that the banks would go down on October 8th. I mean, how much more accurate could you be? This was not some airy-fairy notion. This was not some scary tactic. You said on October 8th we're going to have a crash, and it happened. So if the public and your public doesn't want to hear it, then they don't want to hear it. And they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, they'll be pumped up. If I'm saying to our military boys and our intelligence operatives, you have a duty as, as a commander, as, as a soldier defending the Constitution and the presidency, not Obama, not a person, not his agents, but the presidency, the office of the presidency, as well as a duty to protect your men and women in our country, if you do not stand up to orders that are wrong, that are dangerous to the welfare of our country, then you will be found derelict of duty and you will be subsequently court-martialed and punished. It will not go away. What happens to the American public is that eventually they will remember what goes, what happened and who defaulted. Those of you who were involved in the collusion of 9-11, I know who you are. It's, it's well written out, trust me. This is not some, you know, fancy nonsense that I made up. The list is there. The roundup will be inevitable. You know who you are. You know I've paid generals. They've worked for me as, and the Tom Clancy franchise. There are very definite people who are involved. Those of you in Blackwater Z will understand that if you fight for the dollar or the yen or the mark, you will die accordingly. <clears throat> so there's no if and end and buts here. There's consequences. And guys like me are just simply saying, I do something, I pay the consequence. You do something, you're going to pay the consequence. The uniform, whether you're from Blackwater and you want to work for the dollar and you will die for the dollar, even though I may have trained you after the country, then you will die for the dollar. But don't come and whine and complain to us that you were hung up or you were mistreated. And don't go running to Congressman Waxman and saying you were mistreated. That's not going to work. What's going to work is you want to work for the dollar and you want to work for Marriott under Blackwater and you want to control the crowds in Katrina and you want to be deputized against federal and local law, then you pay the consequences. And the consequences will be severe to you and your family. And I'm not threatening you. But this is what's going to happen. You want to die for the dollar, you will die for the dollar. You want to die for our country, that's a different story. But I'm afraid that most of your audience is either turned off, they're indifferent, they're overwhelmed, they're anxious, they don't know what to do. And what they need is a leadership. Uh, they need a third party, if nothing more. I, I'm tired of listening to Democrats or Republicans or, or the nut wings that we got in the extreme, and we need an independent party. I think America has to coalesce together. You have the social uh, network systems to do it. You did a great job on the on the... Uh, Tea parties. I don't want to hear that the conservatives did that or some right-wing group. I don't want people to be labeled right-wing extremists, but I want you to step out and defend your rights. If you don't do that, nobody's going to help you. And so 
I go back to that old saying, you know, the vox populus vox deus, which means the voice of the people is the voice of God. You state it, things will happen. You don't state it and you don't fight for it, nothing will happen. That's it, uh, Steve. Steve, listen to this, and I want to ask you. Now, I cannot validate this yet, but I'm just saying out, if this is true, what do you make of this? Uh, this is, uh, somebody says this, Steve, this past Saturday evening, I, my son, and two grandsons went to the Supercross races held at Questfield in Seattle. Prior to what was a great event, they had an Air Force color guard, woefully out of step, in parentheses, and about 20 young men entering the service on the field. After the national anthem, the new enlistees were given the enlistment oath right on the field. Grant has been close to 40 years since I went through that, but I do remember something to the effect that I would uphold the Constitution, etc., the oath they administered Saturday evening didn't even mention the Constitutional Law. They swore to, listen to this, obey the President of the United States and the officers appointed above them. When did this change? Question mark. My paranoia is kicking in about what this may mean for the legality of orders issued in any future confrontation between citizens and the military. Well, I, I don't know that it has changed, but if it has changed, it's a total violation of the Constitution. It's a violation of the War Acts. It's a violation of our uh, military code of justice. It's a violation of uh, the presidency. If the president has designated that, then he is in violation of the Constitution, and I think he should resign. Uh, I think that's a very dangerous oath. I would never swear that oath. Uh, I've been involved with five presidents. Uh, I've, I've thrown out one president, Jimmy Carter, in a hostage situation where I had to save 500 hostages. I thought he was incompetent. I still do. But I would never swear an oath to the press person as opposed to the office of the presidency and the Constitution. So that is a very – I don't think uh, the person's paranoid. I think if he heard that, I think he should write it up. I think it should be better known in the Internet. I'm glad he brought it to your attention. But if that's the case – and we have a very serious problem. Now, let me ask you this, too, because this is the last interview we're going to do, and i got to cover these issues, okay? Yes, go ahead, sir. Okay, sir. The thing that is interesting is that people who have been at the rallies, the tea parties, the bottom line is they're being followed by agents, they're being uh, videotaped, they're being absolutely gps Here's the deal. In the census that has taken place, all censuses legal by the Constitution are for people that live at a certain address, how many people live here. But there's a pre-census going out, and the rumor is DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is behind it. And interestingly enough, I have, and ladies and gentlemen, I tried to send Steve prior to the show last yes. night multiple emails that were blocked. But, Steve, I have a dozen emails, literally, that people who were at the rallies, that someone shows up at their house, they don't show up at their neighbor's house, some people have gotten in their cars and followed them, or... They're outspoken Second Amendment advocates, and these GPS, supposedly pre-census people, show up. Now, what I would do is this, is what Scientology did in order to make itself a religion. And I was there when I was working against cults. And that is, they were taking the picture of every federal agent, sending it to their houses, and putting it on the Internet. So what I would say to our audience is, take your own cameras, or your, 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 your telephone cameras, Take the picture of the individual, get his name, his rank, his address, and then stream it on the Internet. So let's use the same PSYOPs technique that they do until they get intimidated. And that's the only way you're going to break down the S-1 that they do on, from the Department of Homeland Security or the FBI. They are not all that smart, but they can be intimidated by the American public. And the simple way to do it is take their photograph, their picture, Stream it on the internet. Give them, ask their name and number and their point, and just stream it. You don't have to say anything else. I would not answer anything. I would not give any answers. Or I would not answer any questions. But I would take their pictures. Scientology became a religion after it literally intimidated IRS agents by using snake in the mailbox, physically intimidating them, and eventually the Justice Department, as cowardly as it was conceded and gave them a tax abatement. That's the famous Scientology. So intimidation does work in this government. So the American the public, though, has to do it, and they have to be clever about it. So in this case, I would use the same PSYOPs technique. Get the names, the numbers, take their pictures, stream it on the Internet, and put a whole website of all of these guys. Would you do the same thing with their GPS positions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I just mimic it. Yeah, with nothing Google, illegal. Yeah, with Google Earth and the see the thing is, yeah. though, yeah, i got to tell you, though it's not illegal, 
people are being have literally being have the hell. Forgive me for saying this, but they're having the hell kicked out of them. I mean, police are now arresting people for taking their pictures because they fear that very thing. That's well, right. that's too bad. But I, then there has to be somebody else watching the police arrested. And what happens with policemen? This is very interesting. When you take down their name and number, and you take down their picture, and if there are prosecutors who are very effective. You stream it on the Internet, and you send it to local prosecutors. If they're not effective, then you stream it through, and you start creating a site of policemen, security operatives, uh, spies who are spying on the American public, and let's start creating a website for them so everybody knows. And so what happens is you use PSYOPs, or what we call agitation propaganda, in reverse. They're trying to instill fear. The best way to handle it is just keep calm and then reverse it. Use GPS, use your own cameras, and stream it on the Internet and start creating websites and blogs. And believe me, policemen will buckle under who are totally inappropriate. Believe me, the DHS will hire very ineffectual people. You go through the TSA, even in Bozeman, Montana, they're worthless. you got 10, 12 people in a small town. Each one doesn't know what they're doing. You know that, right? Absolutely. i got to tell you something. The head uh, law enforcement law what enforcement official there at our airport, and ladies and gentlemen, we now have uh, Steve. The last time I saw him, at least four law enforcement officials on the airport. Okay, came up to me. He used to be a customer of mine. Okay, and he said, "Steve, you ought to see the neat stuff we're getting." He ran through a litany, everything from automatic weapons, suppressors, night vision. I mean, everything that anybody would want in tactical. And I simply looked at him and I said, "Bill, who's the enemy?" That's and, exactly it. And he looked at me dumbfounded. I said, exactly, and I got the same problem. Yeah, I went independently. I went through the Bozeman Airport. Some stupid old man who clearly doesn't know anything looked through my medicine bag. Two ladies were watching him and watching me and said, isn't it tragic? I, they were referring to 9-11. I said, no, it's tragic that you're here and you're doing this stupidity. So if you want to arrest me for telling you you're incompetent and you're stupid, then arrest me. But anyway, we, we get the point. The American public understands that we're going down to the lowest common denominator. The TSA is one of them. Remember that. And then they work with the local sheriffs, which is another one, none of whom have ever seen terrorism, none of whom understand 9-11, none of whom have been in PSYOPs, none of whom have been in, in human intelligence. And the irony is we're getting closer and more incompetent surveillance while we become more vulnerable. Our ports are vulnerable. Our railroads are vulnerable. Believe me, if a terrorist want to do anything, it's very simple. Terrorism isn't about destroying something. I can get on the radio <clears throat> as a physician with my credentials and explain to everybody now that your water supply has anthrax and botulism on it. So whoever drinks will die. Now, that's only a case. I'm clearly not saying that. But I can create terror just by getting on the phone. I can create terror by Internet cyber warfare. I can create terror is a state of mind. It is not in a, an entity that is destroyed or in any way mutilated. It is a fear that's created by an institution. And in this case, it's the United States government. It created 9-11. It created the terror of the Tonkin Resolution. It created the Liberty Ship, a false flag. I mean, we have had a history of Republicans and Democrats creating terror in order to control and this notion of uh, we're going to neutralize the Taliban is absurd, absolutely beyond absurd, but it's more tragic because our boys are dying there needlessly for the transnational corporations, and our boys are dying in Iraq because as they, one of the soldiers who just came back said, there's nothing else we can do. What so, are you, yeah, my, my chief complaint is the way our veterans are being treated. Now, the Department of Homeland Security, and I believe you have seen this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Steve travels all over let's just say the world, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I catch him when I can at some <laughs> foreign port and find out what yeah, we can... Yeah, but you always find me, Steve. Yes, I do. Well, and and the intelligence th community can't, but you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just because I'm your friend. But again, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the thing that's important to understand is, is that, Steve, the Department of Homeland Security made all, emphasis, all veterans potential terrorists. Now, well, I think it is both absurd, it is, it's a name, and it's dangerous. Okay. And I wouldn't be surprised if they execute that uh, uh, concept and they literally feel that any veteran who, who will come back and who has served our country honorably, which most of them have, and I've seen many of these veterans, it is just a terrible, terrible damage that's done. I have friends 
who treat the, uh, uh, the veterans, particularly in the Sepulveda the VA, who tell me that there's more and more PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, than we've ever seen, almost 46% in very intelligent uh, 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 population of veterans, they will not tolerate it. And if the uh, government insists, and the Department of Homeland Security, which is an absolute disaster and a joke, given who the governor of Arizona is, a dyke who was a disaster in Arizona, who was a total, has no idea of what national security is other than having some statements about illegal immigrants in a state that is a free-for-all state where you've produced also McCain. I'm not a great fan of McCain, as you can see. The bottom line is, if that's the case, then the veterans arm yourself and fight back, and then you will have the support of the American public. Absolutely. And I go know. back to the years of the 1920s when it was the veteran wars, and the guys came back, women and men came back from World War I, and they were treated shabbily as they are treated now, and they used the government used a general by the name of Douglas MacArthur to kill and control all the veterans on the mall. Now, you are the forefront of this army. You have paid the price. If we see the videos of veterans being beaten up, arrested, slaughtered, that will be the catalyst for the Second Civil War. The country will break apart on that very basis. Well, I, I believe I believe that is the 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 absolute desire. Let me tell you something. Two specific returning vets were off. They were assassinated in one of the hospitals, the Army Hospital in the East Coast, okay? It, two of them were assassinated. You know one thing. They knew somebody or something that someone made sure they wouldn't tell. Now we've got the uh, present administration, I call it the ultimate fiasco, basically turning a blind eye to vets. And, Steve, you're the, you are the psychiatrist. Look at how this is happening. Allegiance to the country no longer means anything. Allegiance to the man means everything. And well, that's, it's not going to happen. We have well, never forgive me, had it's not going to happen you know, unless people let it happen. Well, it's not going to happen because I have faith in the American public, despite the fact that I may reprimand them. I still have faith. That's the only reason you and I go on for this last breath, so to speak, because we're saying to you again, you the public, if you do not stand up, I don't care who the President of the United States is, we have been ill-served by every president, particularly by Clinton, by Bush, no question, and now by Obama. It is going downhill rapidly. We are in what they call the law of thermodynamics in the third state of the law of thermodynamics, which is entropy. We will hit chaos. And chaos may be a, a good function or a bad function, depending on how, what you do about it. But when the governor of Texas says, maybe we should secede from the union, and people say, shame on you, and he retreats from that, that was a very shameful act. He was right. There may be secessions of states from the union. Well, I That's only going to happen when the people of the United States realize we may not need a republic. It no longer serves us from Washington. Well, listen, and that is heresy. Right. But the thing is, Rick Perry is a governor, okay? Right. He was grandstanding. By the way, he is the Bilderberger poster child, okay? When he went to the G20 meetings and when he's gone to the Bilderbergers, the bottom line is is that he, for him to say that it was a photo opportunity, for him to retreat yeah. was validation that it was a photo opportunity. The thing is, though, even Montana, you and I live in Montana, yeah. okay? And as you know, right now, we have state rights issues with firearms, and we got some great guys. Gary Marbet of the Montana Shooting Sports Foundation. Man, that guy is, in my book, a modern Thomas Jefferson. I've interviewed him years ago, okay? Yeah. But we've got people here. It's a funny thing, Steve. We elect guys like like Bacchus and, and, and some of That's the other. Uh, yeah, and, and the deal is. Not a disaster. Yeah, it, it's, but yeah, we, we're, our motto, ladies and gentlemen, is the treasure state. And that's exactly, you know, that's exactly why the feds want us. Well, we have two disasters who are Democrat and one Republican disaster, all of whom on the right. payroll. Right. That's exactly it. Well, you know, you've done what you could, Steve. It's, a, it's not a mutual admiration society, but we do like each other, and we're willing to go on the air because, quite frankly, we don't do it without any trepidation that we may be injured. Uh, you know, this is not scot-free, and I want the American public to understand that. We do that because we believe enough in what we say and what we do. This is not rhetoric. We're not politicians. We don't want to be politicians. But unless we're agents of changes and you follow through, Steve and I will go on and uh, we'll say it was too bad. It was just too bad. It could have changed and they didn't want it. So, you know, basically we deserve what we get. 
You wanted Obama, you got Obama. You want socialism, you got socialism. You want bullshit, you got bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. And you got unemployment, you got welfare, you have companies that are going down, and we have a weak army, a weak intelligence corps, and a huge bloated, bloated uh, 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 budget. Both Republican and Democrats are to blame. And Ron Paul is not the solution. No. Tell me about a man who's a physician like I am, who's in Congress for 25 years and spouts out things, but receives a weekly paycheck. That's not what I respect. I'm an entrepreneur. Steve is an entrepreneur. We live and die by whether we make money on that day, and we're small businessmen. That's what we're talking about all over this country. Talking about the car salesman, the 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 the, the, the you know the the grocer, the man who has that small business, the woman who runs a small business. Small business needs anything below 500 million, but that's not what we're used to right now. We're not getting the breaks, and if we don't get the breaks, we're not going to build a, a society that can really be viable. The banks won't do it. They're total disasters. They are they are basically ossified social welfare systems. The uh, the, uh, the the politicians are nothing more than a glorified social welfare, self-aggrandizing, uh, you know, worthless people. And the president you know, doesn't give a shit. He's just going around spouting everything he wants, and a total total sociopath. So that's what I see. You can buy it, you can believe it, but basically I tell you, I've rarely been wrong in my predictions, and neither has, and, and, and Steve Goyle has rarely been wrong. Well, again, Steve, you know, the thing that, the thing that's most disheartening is that even the people that are listening to this broadcast, and by the way, I'll have a count for you of how many federal computers went on. Well, I'm sure they know me. Well, now. forgive me, I'm the name correctly, P-I-E-C-Z-E-N-I-K, boys. Right. You're but getting I, a lot of money to follow me. Can I ask you this? Yeah. Did, can we address this? I spoke to you yeah. about my sources were talking about how many generals in the U.S. military were paid off. I won't go into any names, okay? Yeah. And you said when you went back there, is this correct, that all they cared about was their pensions. Yes. And they did not understand the fundamental uh, rule of the economy. You can't get a pension if there's no one to pay you anything. Well, they didn't care. They just wanted to make sure they were serving 30 years, 32 years, and they had a place to go even though they weren't effective in doing anything. So, after you serve, what the public doesn't know, after serving about 20, 24 years, you're not really making any money. You're, the, you're basically giving your service. You're basically wasting your time in government. But, you know, most people look for a sinecure. That's including the military. And it really has to be uh, pared down and effectively, uh, uh, you know, retested. And but the kids don't want to go into it, and I understand some of their problems. But for the most part, I find there's a serious dereliction of duty among the senior commanders. It still is. They want to get promoted. They want their three, four stars, and then they'll go off and get their million, two million dollars at Booz Allen, like the other guys did, who was head of the CIA. Or they'll become uh, the uh, sync pack commanders. I mean, basically they become politicians, and that's not what we need. Well, again, the thing is, is though, uh, somebody said, the, the, listen, I've had four-star generals, four-star active spec op command guys tell me that the red list, and, and you know this, when you went into a country to, uh, let's say this, overthrow it or take it down or replace, you know, a brutal regime, the bottom line is you knew the people you had to deal with, right? Oh, yeah. No, no, that was all human. I, I can give you even a specific, very interesting uh, tale. I mean, I was asking my generals in my, my uh, 05s and 06s in this lecture I was giving, well, how do you change a regime? I've changed several of them, what we call regime change or a military coup. And most of the uh, people in the audience were, I know, they, they, they really had no idea. And they, they said, well, of course, we have tanks, we have airplanes, we have APCs. I said, wrong. The first thing I do is I know who my opponent general is, and I go to see him, and I ask him how many years does he have left on his pension, and how much would he like on his pension. And nine out of ten times, I'm pretty effective in changing a regime. I didn't need a soldier going into Iraq. The military knew that. The military wanted to go in. Donald Rumsfeld wanted to go in. Most regime changes occur very subtly through the intelligence community, knowing human and knowing how to turn around the military, their, the opponent military, through their pension funds and, and payments. And that's really what's been done in Afghanistan, although not effectively, and in Iraq. They've been wasting a lot of cash, but they don't know human. 
So again, we're in we're in serious trouble. I hate to repeat it a hundred times, but I think your audience gets the message. The only thing now is for them to get up and do something about it. And the bottom line is is that we're now in a position where it doesn't have to be any plainer. And and I've basically told people for a long time, look, if if it doesn't mean anything to you that you don't have a, uh, do you know how many people I fought on forums, literally thousands of forum postings against me, I was trying to get people out of their 401ks and their IRAs and their Kios and all that crap. Do you remember our conversation the first yep. time we met? Yep. And the thing is, is that, the, the, you know, oh, I'm crazy. My broker says this. My broker says that. Is is the financial uh, scenario that you see on uh, non-intelligent TV broadcast 24-7, doesn't it even amaze you as a psychiatrist that the mind controlling is so absolutely uh, uh, predictable that these people are being robbed, they're being plundered. I mean, if a pirate ship showed up, and yet they just sit back and go, well, I guess I lost my future and my retirement. Well, because it's easier to have denial. And I often say to people, denial is not a river in Egypt. It's a right. defense mechanism that says, I don't want to be responsible for what I do. I mean, give the example of Kramer, whatever his name is, James Kramer, who screams and yells about mad money and said, you guys have to invest in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and all the others. And, of course, it was total psyops. It was total nonsense. But if people insist on watching that nonsense and they want to just look at it and see what, you know, that's their problem. We we can't assume responsibility for most people, Steve. No, no, I understand. You know, I tell people now when I hear any of those guys saying the bottom's in, the bottom's in on the housing market, the bottom's in on the investment, good time to buy. The only person that basically knows the bottom's in is when he's basically on his back in a coffin. He's up against the... uh bottom being in, and what I'm saying by that, that, that is a sure uh, case of financial lunacy. Listen, on Friday, Bear Stearns, Kramer, let's take Kramer, okay? Right. He's on the radio, Steve, telling everybody that, or one guy called in, $54 a share of Bear Stearns. On Saturday, I'm getting a call from one of the head bankers for Citibank telling me, watch what happens to Bear Stearns on on Monday, it's toast. Do you know why? The Fed, including the head of the Fed, was in Citibank's headquarters, and someone listened to this show was there. And uh, I think it went from fifty-four dollars on Friday to fifty-four bucks or fifty-four cents, fifty-four cents on Monday before it rebounded. Well, but that—that's the point. I mean, stupid in, stupid out. You basically are—they're recycling all the junk and all the wishful thinking. Everybody who knew banking knew that Citibank was a disaster even before the banking crisis. I'd taken over about 20 SNL savings and loans in Maryland, and we did it very quietly. We shut down the media. We we closed down the banks, and people got their money back. Well, that's uh, exactly that's not the way it's done now because yeah. Paulson was an apt. He was an investment banker, which doesn't mean he's a banker. You got uh, you you have uh, uh, Greitner, who is a, a real disaster. He comes out of political science. The IMF forgot to pay his taxes. Secretary of Treasury. He never did anything. He's never done a business in his life. Uh, he's a uh, what I call a pablum baby from a think tank. Uh, the uh, IMF was a disastrous organization, still is. I mean, the man, the uh, Secretary of Treasury, didn't pay five years of taxes. If you and I pulled that, I think I'd be seeing you in prison, no, Steve? Yeah, we'd be we'd be uh, wishing for a change of attire. Correct. Because right. yeah, then, because I, I'd be then, yelling at you that can't you aren't you tired of wearing those stripes? Yeah. You know? Well, I'd say, no, you look good in that. You know, you got slimmer. But the, yeah. the, the, the other one is Summers. I mean, another piece of work who was thrown out of Harvard. His father and mother were Nobel Prize winners. Well, uncle, father and uncle were Nobel Prize winners. He himself is not the brightest whip. He's a student of uh, Ron Rubin, another disaster from Goldman Sachs who came out of Miami. I mean, you're talking about an inbred group out of Goldman Sachs who've never made money on their own, who are basically shifting dollars back and forth with no value added no net worth, and basically are saying to people, we know best, when Paulson knew nothing about banking, Summers knows nothing about banking. And as I said to you before, he received $5.1 million, of which 4.8 came from a hedge fund. He makes $134,000 each speech and has the goal to explain what, what we're doing right now and has no idea that the banks themselves, once they, they, they try to uh, resuscitate the banks, we have absolute no money left when the whole system goes down. And that's what's happening in Ireland. And Ireland is a good example. And, and one of the senators from Ireland, Mark Daly, uh, who's a friend of mine, was here in Montana a year ago. And I tried to help him 
uh, explain the situation as they were going under under their housing and then their uh, loan program. And now their their prime minister and, and politicians have been a disaster. So the real issue here comes to the fact that we have people in a hierarchical situation who are incompetent. It's not as if they say, oh, we've never seen this before. Yeah, we have seen this before. Uh, there was the SNL crisis. We've had it in 73. We've had it in 79, 86. Uh, the point is there is no crisis management capability here, and what we have instead is the, the, the flotsam and jetsam of human society, which is basically process people who come out of think tanks and investment banking houses who've never been accountable for their own deeds and basically shifting money. They've never built anything. They're not a farmer. They're not a doctor. Uh, they're not a businessman. Uh, they're not a gold trader or creating assets. They're not an entrepreneur. So we have put our lives and our, in our, uh, our, our well-being in the hands of the most incompetent, the most lazy, the most arrogant, and the most ineffectual and corrupt. corrupt. So I don't know why people are surprised. The only way to get rid of it is not to vote them out. The vote isn't worth anything. It's to fight them out and to arrest them. And I, once you do that, you put fear into the system, and boy, does it work. Lee Kuan Yew used to do that in Singapore, and he had 500 technocrats who were responsible for the whole country. And boy, did they run that country exceedingly well. The whole notion that you can't put chewing gum on the floor was true. But on the other hand, he created a society that after 20 years of fighting, corruption, communism, and drugs, ran like a uh, uh, like a beautiful humming machine, and people are wealthy, and they're doing quite well. And there's transparency. So there are models for that. But unfortunately, we don't have that leader. We don't have that kind of uh, capability. So once again, I say to you, uh, Steve, you, you, I'm, I'm impressed what you're doing because that's why I'm willing to go back on the air. But I don't think I will come back on the show until I see something in the streets. And, right. And, uh, you know, a lot of emails are coming in. I've probably got a 100 since the start of the show, okay? Really? Just too many questions to ask. But again, it sounds to me like at least my listeners, most of them, not not... I can't say all of them because, you know, obviously I know who listens to the show. But the bottom line is people are saying, thank you. Thank Dr. Steve for telling us what to do. Like one guy said, they've got their red list. We make ours, okay? Yeah. yeah and I, mean, and I got to tell you that. I want your, part, your audience to say the following. Look, they want to instill fear. The best way to create fear is, is to deflect the fear, say nothing, and then just reinstill it back again into the people who are monitoring you. You take their names. You take their numbers. You take their address and you stream it, and you keep on putting websites, and you keep on saying, these are people who you have to watch, these are the people who are watching you, and use the Internet. At the same time, get pictures of them, posters. Bring it all the way up the system, because what the people fear in the systems is fear itself. And the best way to penetrate the system is to instill fear from the public, and then you make them personally liable. If a, if a policeman is out of control and he's beating one of us up because we're protesting, get his picture, The Rod, what was that, that Rodney Danger uh, episode? Rodney his King. Picture, yeah, put Rodney. it on the Internet, stream it, make sure his family's on the pictures as well until you create such fear in that policeman and in his family and his unit until they understand that you know how to manipulate fear. And that's what's happening. It's fear being imposed on the American citizen. Now the American citizen has to put fear back into the government. And without that, it's not going to change. But believe me, as a manipulator of fear, as somebody who knows how to work fear, and taking down the Soviet Union, and taking down Aldo Moro, a prime minister of Italy, a real scumbag, and I neutralized him, I have no qualms using fear. I have no qualms using fear against my own government, because it's not my government. So I want the American public to understand you have the ability. You hear the voices of two men who are concerned. We're not politicians. We're not coming out of an ideology. We're not selling you bill of goods. We are just simply telling you, you have the ability to fight back. Use the weapons of fear against the people who are trying to follow you and suppress you. Get their names, their numbers. If they insist on fighting you and hitting you, take those pictures and stream it right through the Internet and get to their families, their friends, and see what happens. And believe me, you will break down their systems. All right? Well, I, mean, I, I want to thank you for that. And my final question for you is, what, I mean, absolutely, the, the, as, as, as a psychiatrist and as right. someone that's 
when when the total Remember, rate. Remember, I'm not a member of the American Psychiatric. I put the I president of the American Psychiatric. I reported him for being uh, corrupt. Yeah, no, I understand that. But let, let's say this: the idea that 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 all the major corporations, some of the biggest ones in the country, i.e., GM used to be one, okay, are shutting down for the summer. The idea, Steve, that the biggest, quote, terrorism exercise, look, everybody that I've talked to, even a, cor- a Navy SEAL that contacted me, I post them, and for the record, the hyenas and jackals, that's what I call my critics, you know, <laughs> if I know their name, I'm not going to bo- post it. So when somebody gets on a blog and he's, he's a paid shiller, just an ignorant ass, and says, well, uh, the stink of unnamed sources is as bad as blah, 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 the bottom line is is that I know the names of these people, and I, I've had so many military guys. I want you to address this final issue, if you would, when we've got about two minutes left. Yeah. The military is now requiring personal-owned weapons by serial number to be basically given to them, okay, to be turned into the provost, Marshal, that are off base. That's, right. never, that's never happened before. And this is what I would do. I would ask each one who's handing in their guns to give their serial number, just as they do before they get arrested, if they don't want to do that. Take the name and serial number of the person requesting it and his commander and then put it on the web and then say, I'd like to have your name and number as well. And then there are others who can say, I won't do that. And here is my gun and all. You can arrest me. Let somebody document it. And that's the basis of the conflict that we need. Because if you get intimidated to give the name and the number of your serial number for whatever reason, you can really re, 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 you can return the intimidation very simply by saying, can I have your name and number? If you don't want to do that, then take a picture with your camera, have a friend do the same thing, stream it on the Internet. It's a very powerful tool. Right. These men are being threatened, and you're, 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 you're aware of military stuff. They're being threatened with court-martial. Well, you know what? Threaten. Let them be court-martial, because the first one who gets court-martial brings out the case. And one of the things the military fears in a court-martial is public uh, recognition. When I was threatened with uh, treason by one of the senior officials in, in uh, the Bush Jr. administration, I said I'd be happy to go forth as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, I would be happy to be in, on trial and go to prison for going against Bush Jr. because he is a tyrant. He has violated the Constitution. He is a war criminal. I have no problem saying that. And by the way, lest you forget, I also am the co-writer, but basically the writer of the Tom Clancy Op Center Net Forces, and Jack Ryan and uh, other characters are based on me. So what would you like to do? I think they dropped it. But my point is, that counter threats are very effective. If you have to be in a system, never forget American citizens. There are fearful men. You divide and conquer. Divide and conquer them. All right? It's an old principle. That's what they're doing to us. We do it back to them. Thank and you, Let's Steve. get a third party, an independent party. Hey, Amen. You know, we'll find somebody that's real. Steve, thank you. We're going to lose you, our Steve. satellite. God bless America. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, again, this will, unless something changes, be the last broadcast with Dr. Steve Pachinik. He's someplace out of this area, and he was very kind to give up uh, uh, a lot of his uh, business tonight to come on the broadcast. God bless. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Steve. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, take this stuff to heart, and quit listening to all the naysayers on the Tree of Liberty. Bye-bye. Bye. Obama should be uh, the gun salesman of the year because, as you're aware, since he came, in, yes, he came into uh, office. Every every firearm that's a black gun, that means a semi-automatic. Every pretty much round down to 22 has been bought up. So let me share this. You and I have been on the radio for a couple of years now, right. talking about this day. And again, the thing that I, you know, I'm accused of overreacting. Okay, now you know me pretty well, and you know my sources. And for the record, I'm going to state this. I don't ask Steve his names of your sources, do I? No. Nor do you ask me my sources. No. But when we get multiple verifications through our independent uh, sources, and they, they basically are almost global in their reach and where they are, then we know that something's up, correct? That's correct. I mean, they, we'll give the classical example of that rocket. I mean, right. We, but would, you, would you please address that? Because I am so sick. Of you know being told I'm full of you know what and and well, I say it, this it, look it, I, it's not I, that I'm I defensive. I think your audience should know. Was it about a year ago? Yeah. It was during the summer and and I live in 
about three miles away from uh, Steve, and, and we are friendly and we do discuss things, but we don't always agree, so that I think the audience has to understand that. Yeah, and we but don't. Independent of Steve, I, I was uh, in my backyard, and suddenly out of nowhere, I saw a plume, a trail going up of a rocket in Bozeman, Montana. Now, we don't have an installation there. This had to have been a portable rocket. This had to have been a rocket that was ad hoc, placed in a, in a place, and I looked at it, and the plume stood there for about 60 seconds or 90 seconds. And I said, good God, what's this about? So I happened to have met Steve the next day. And I said, Steve, you won't believe this. But I just saw a trail of a rocket. I mean, it's not a jet plane. I know a fighter jet and I know what a local jet. This is straight up, perpendicular to the ground. And lo and behold, what did Steve tell me? You tell him. Well, I, my, a friend of mine, one of my clients and I were coming back from Livingston, Montana, which is east of Bozeman, looking to the west, actually west-northwest, and where you live, and I won't give details, right. but it would have been north of you. Right. And the thing is, I said, Steve, this is amazing, because we actually saw something right. uh, that was basically hidden at one point, explodes, and then where we were at, because of this, the sun's altitude, or actually the attitude of the sun, the angle of the sun, it was a kind of like a red mist, and and my friend who was with me, a very wise and and uh, uh, how should I say this, well placed uh, woman for the record, was basically convinced we we're at World War Three. I then got on the phone to Hawk, my co-host, and I asked him. I said, "Are you guys picking up anything in the uh, communications realm?" And he said, "Yeah, there's a lot of chatter." So while I'm watching this and you're watching this, but from separate locations, never having compared stories. We're getting all this chatter that basically the emergency action messages are going out, so somebody blew up something out of the air. And, Steve, a couple of weeks after that, and I got my share of, you know, you're insane, all this stuff, but even on Larry King, they had somebody had taken a video of that and claimed, and I'm not saying this, but claimed that we and some of our basically top-secret stuff had launched a missile against a UFO. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying yeah, is yeah. you and I both saw it independently. Yeah, the there, same. Was a missile, there was a missile trip. But let's get back to the key point of guns being taken away. That's right. not going to happen. I mean, okay. And I would fight it. I would encourage the United States, the citizens of this country, to fight it. That is our Second Amendment. Uh, there is no rash, uh, a rationalization or excuse to take away those guns, uh, the people I know in Montana and elsewhere who have guns, they use it for hunting. They don't go around. We have licenses in Montana. I don't see anybody carrying guns in the town. Uh, those who have trained for guns, no guns, are very effective in not using it when they don't have to. Those who want to use a gun and are crazy and will use it, they'll use it anyway. So I can't prevent somebody from taking a gun and shooting everybody. That's not going to happen. Nor am I a believer that you need an AK-47 to hunt a deer. In between the two, however, the right to bear arms in the United States is essential. If Obama thinks or his minions think that in any way, particularly Eric Holder, thinks he's the Attorney General, that he can take away guns or numerate the number of guns that will be out there and then make sure that they don't appear or you have to hand them back in, that's going to be a big mistake. I would be happy to confront them on, on a level which we would add up to violence. And I'm not against violence. I, th I, I think what's important for the audience to understand is, even though I've been in psychological operations, I have also been in operational levels where we have used violence to neutralize different elements. Now, I have said it repeatedly. I've said it on this show. I've said it on other shows. I have served my country eight times. I have been willing to die eight times for my country. And I have not gotten a pension. So I want everybody to know, nor do I work for a, uh, uh, a military industrial complex. I have to work for myself. I have no problem going into the streets and acting in a violent way if my freedoms will be suppressed. If he continues with the, uh, the uh, Patriots game, uh, Act, if he continues with suppressing our right to bear arms, if he continues to make sure that we cannot have protests in the streets, as I saw there in Bozeman and elsewhere, then Obama will be confronted with what I suspect has been long coming, and that is his false expectations, his betrayal, his deceit, and his, his grandiose promises, and this incredible 
arrogance that he shows, he will be met with violence to the American public. I do not think it's an accident that the governor of Texas, correct my his name, I don't remember, said very clearly that we should secede from the Union. Having said that, I make no apologies for saying that. The United States of America may not remain a republic, and perhaps should not. I am not a great believer that the aggrandizement of federal power is in the best interest of the individual or the citizen. I am a great believer of what I wrote 10 years ago in a book called State of Emergency, where the local government in Nye County, Nevada, confronted the federal government over water rights, and it was literally guns to guns. This is not something I made up. And I predicted 12, 13 years ago there would be an impending second civil war. Now, whether it's over guns, whether it's over illegal immigrants, whether it's over suppression of liberties, whether it's over joblessness or an economy that he cannot fix, and I can assure you this will not be fixed, whether it's over unemployment, I predict there will be violence in the street as there should be. Now, am I treasonous? Yes. Is that the first time I'm treasonous? No. I believe that in an age of tyranny, that an individual who is treasonous must be able to be called a patriot. And I've said that to Bush when I said, your brother and your son is a disaster. I will work against him with the military to make sure he will have no power over our military, which he didn't. But I will be treasonous. In that, in the name of tyranny, as a treasonous, as a treasonous individual, I consider myself a patriot. And that's the way I think your audience should understand that. Right. I'm not blithe about it. I'm not complacent. I'm not happy to say that. But unfortunately, the American public has gotten fat, lazy, disinterested, uninterested. They're being fed pablum on CNN and Larry King and all that nonsense. And at the same time, the papers are worthless. So you're going to have to be able to look at information, call it out, listen to Steve Quayle, question him, question me. I don't believe that everything I say should be taken at heart. I don't believe I say the truth or Steve says the truth, but we bring to you a very convincing perspective. And by the way, it was Steve who predicted on October 8th we would have a bank failout, and it happened on October 8th. It was I who predicted we would have this 9-11, then we would have another false flag operation, and that we would go into Iraq, we would try to look for a war in Iran through Israel, and then we would go into Afghanistan none of which has anything to do with our national security. Steve, here's a good question. I'm curious as his background as a PSYOP expert as to what you think would be, meaning you, Steve, would be the most effective form of uh, protesting for the public. Clearly, he believes the election process is hopelessly corrupt. I agree. And that we need to do much more than the Tea Party. At the same time, the powers that be are probably waiting for an overly aggressive event on behalf of an agreed public to declare us terrorists and bring about martial law. By the way, I want you to address that, too. So let's, let's deal with the first thing. What, in your opinion, is going to be effective? Because you and I have talked at length about the coming civil war. There yeah. will be a civil war. The balkanization of the United States. Let there be no, uh, we are in agreement on that yeah. point. But the point is, okay, so this gentleman, Chris, is asking, what's the best thing? A boycott of the dollar? A national work strike? Well, I think it's a combination of the boycott of the dollar, taking dollars out of the banks. I've said it a long time ago, I think, which did an excellent job at the time under Richard Helms and, and people who were not there, but thought uh, Gates was uh, a, and a junior officer. Uh, they were good people, and, and we were able to really create an agitation at the different levels and create uh, dissension, or what we call agitprop, agitation propaganda. So using psychological operations, using cultural dynamics, understanding psychology, and understanding the use of the military without having to fight, we were able to take down the Soviet Union. Uh, Gorbachev did not give it to us. It did not just inevitably slip. It was not the theories of some uh, conservative ideologue who they claimed. It was not a product of the neocons. It was the product of a very practical president who made a very practical order, and I happen to have been very honored to lead the architecture in that, but it really involved a lot of people who were very talented at the time. Well, Steve, given the fact that, again, nothing's changed except the occupant of the White House, in, in retrospect, 
what I would, and don't take this wrong, but the old timers that understood national security and that really in some, uh, some definable ways, the best example is one you just gave, they really cared for this country. Now explain to the people the PSYOPs operation going on against them with the, the destruction of the First Amendment rights. I mean, soon the Second Amendment, you're, you've been uh, clued in. I know you have. Uh, I've sent you emails. Well, it goes be- before that. Even it, it goes way beyond the time you and I met, Steve. Uh, I, I have gone on your show and I've gone on many shows, including Alex Jones' show. Uh, the minute 9-11 came aboard, I mean, I don't want to belabor it again, uh, 9-11 uh, is not what we call a frontal attack by uh, al-Qaeda. What it was, in effect, was a stand-down operation. It's a PSYOPs operation where the United States uh, stood down. That means they ordered all their Army and military and Air Force to stand down. The biggest culprit here would probably have been the Air Force, NORAD, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Myers, uh, Cheney, Wolfowitz, the neocons. And the reason for it, I said it very clearly then, six years ago, said 9-11. I knew the day after when I was quoted in the Military Intelligence Journal, this is either collusion or incompetence. But certainly, uh, it didn't just happen. Uh, I say it was collusion because several of my generals who worked for me in military intelligence literally said to me sheepishly that this was a stand-down. A stand-down means that we have ordered uh, all of our soldiers that came directly from Cheney and Bush. Uh, Bush is not just a puppet. It went through Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice. These are your culprits, and they were never indicted, never investigated, especially by this administration, who's also cowardly. Of course, never assaulted by the Democrats who are now in power by many of the congressmen who you see in flaunting themselves. Basically what happened, once 9-11 occurred, there was a PSYOPs operation which created the denial of distraction so that we could go forth, the president could go forth and attack Iraq, which of course everybody now knows was lies, and I had said it beforehand, I'm on record, and then eventually to attack Iran, which was again not a threat, and using uh, neoconservatives uh, who were related and tied to Israel, the theory was between Israel and the United States, they were to conquer uh, the Middle East, they would attack Iran, then eventually Syria, and they would be democracy. Well, it all became for naught. I was on the radio way before that, and then eventually on your show, I said, be careful of the government. It has played a PSYOPs operation. It is milked out and basically uh, 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 parasitically uh, 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 eaten out the flesh and fiber of our own country in order to implement wars that did not need to be uh, uh, existed, that, and it did not have to be uh, in, in, in uh, existence. It, it bled out our country in terms of money, in terms of the men and women who died. Uh, they served our country, these men and women, but I have reprimanded the generals, and there is a severe dereliction of duty among those generals. I think it is a travesty that... Uh, in the New York Times and elsewhere, the Congress is a cowardly Congress, says that you cannot criticize our generals, and that's a lie. I will criticize General Petraeus for what he did in Afghanistan. I will criticize General Derno, knowing fully well these men know they do not belong in Afghanistan. Uh, General Petraeus was put in to substitute for Bremer. I was part of that group and working with our own senior generals in military intelligence. I came in as a volunteer. And I will tell you again, there is a dereliction of duty among our military, senior military officers who have to kowtow and want to kowtow to this President of the United States who has never served our country and questionably may not be of our country. But let's get forward. So what has happened? There's a PSYOPs operation which said that we, in effect, have a democracy. Well, it's a very hard concept to say that we have a democracy when I go into a food store and as my, senior, as my oldest daughter once said to me, Dad, the United States of America works in self-delusion. We go to a food store, we have 25 different brands of coffee, 30 brands of sugar, and 40 brands of toothpaste. We go to our political system for the presidency, and we have two choices. Neither one is very good, but those are the two choices, and we claim that's a democracy and the shift in power. Then we go to our health system, we have one choice. So what in fact happened is the PSYOPs operation that I think continued on from the Bush administration on went through the Clintons where they made a deal. They were paid off. No question Hillary was paid off. She was given Secretary of State, which is a not great position for her. Many millions of hundreds of millions of dollars, I am certain, was given to Hillary Clinton to buy off that election and her debt. And who are the people that give it? Well, they're the supporters. You have the banking industry. You have the military-industrial complex. 
you have the transnational corporations. This is not a conspiracy. This is not something that I just made up and I'm going to, I'm an extremist. I'm a pragmatist. I worked under Baker and Bush. We're not, we're not ideologues. We, we care about national security. Now, why are these different elements so important to the transition of power? Because they have a vested interest in making sure that their power base, i.e. the military industrial complex, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, L3 Communications, Boeing, all of which really do not add value to our society. And the, and the most nefarious of all is called Blackwater, where Cheney brought in a group of Hessian soldiers, mercenaries, 100,000 of them, despite, in order to, quote, protect our diplomats. Well, if you can't be protected, that's too bad. You want to know the truth? Um, most of our diplomats are not worth the salt they're in, and I can tell you as a deputy assistant secretary, I would have closed down most of the embassies. They're not really very effective because we have virtual diplomacy now on the Internet, but nevertheless, we hired these contract officers, 100,000 mercenaries. That means their loyalty is to the paycheck. I don't care what they were before. It is not the loyalty to our country. So what our country has done is to train our brave men and women, and then the mercenaries and men like Christian, who were ahead of Blackwater and others, and they now change the name to ZXE because they're cowardly and, and know that they're being reprimanded, and now they're the ones who kill our men who we train, and they make profit from it. All right, so their loyalty is not to our country. Now, what makes it even more nefarious? This president, who has no idea of what war is about, has no idea of national security, has surrounded himself with the same cannon fodder that I worked with, Mr. Brzezinski, who was a disaster under the Carter administration, brought us such great things as the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot, which I then had to come in 20 years later to undo and create a treaty in order to prevent them from killing themselves again. Carter, once again, lied to the public. He never talked about the fact that he protected Pol Pot. We have the same gentleman, Brzezinski, and guess who else? Richard Holbrook. Richard Holbrook I personally like, but a man who has vested in creating wars. Why? Because that's how he becomes famous. He has hired an archivist, if anybody's doubted. He hires a, uh, a publicist. And now he's in charge of Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's called... The envoy. Now, the reason he's called an envoy of the mission is because he doesn't need senatorial confirmation. And he couldn't pass a senatorial confirmation because he was with an investment banking firm. Now, Richard doesn't know anything about investment banking. Furthermore, he doesn't really know very much about national security other than what he feels he thinks is right. Richard Holbrook's history goes back to the days of the Phoenix Project. Those of you in the audience who remember in Vietnam, we used to drop people out of the helicopters in interrogation that was part of a nefarious CIA operation, which wasn't too effective. And Richard was in charge as assistant secretary of the Pacific, East Asia and the Pacific, and guess what he did? He was supporting Pol Pot under the directions of Carter. Richard Holbrook protected Pol Pot in Thailand and allowed the Khmer Rouge, after they were being slaughtered by the Vietnamese, our so-called enemy who defeated us already, they were beating the, the hell out of the Khmer Rouge Richard Holbrook, under the orders of Carter, protected Khmer Rouge. Now, that's crime. He was never brought up for those charges. But what he's famous for, and this is the real hook of another psyops, he's famous for, quote, resolving the peace conflict in Bosnia. Well, all he did was to separate Milosevic, who was then the president, and a guy named Karachik, who, by the way, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going directly into the show tonight because we've got to cover a massive amount of information in two hours. This is a special broadcast. My very special guest, Dr. Steve Pachinik, America's national hero, as so many publications who know who he is have already declared him to be. He was a deputy under Secretary of State under five different presidents. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the man you read about when you read about Tom Clancy's novel, and the hero in Tom Clancy's novel. The interesting thing is is that uh, the books that he has written with Clancy have been 26 times on the New York bestsellers list. He's got multiple PhDs, and this is a man that has served his country for all of his life, who loves his country, and now is absolutely heartbroken and determined with all his might to do whatever he can to inform the people that it is late in the game. With that information... I want you to welcome Dr. Steve Pachinik. Hi, Steve. Hi, uh, Steve. It's always a pleasure. Hello to the audience. I think some of you may remember me for 
couple of months ago where Steve and I were on the show and talking about the impending crash of the banks and uh, how uh, the system would collapse and that even a transition of power into a new administration wouldn't change very much. And unfortunately, Steve, I think you're correct. We have, again, a major, major problem in the United States. It's a continuing problem. It's a continuing problem that the government has no longer served the people the government is superseding the rights of the individual. The Constitution is still being suppressed by the Patriots Act, by the uh, uh, Wiretap Act, by the writ of habeas corpus, which uh, has not been invoked, and by an administration that feels we need a war, still another war, in Afghanistan, which, of course, the president himself said, ironically, is of defeat and it's a disaster, but he's still sending 17,000 to 30,000 new boys. So we have once again a conundrum, and once again our politicians have lied, betrayed, and deceived us. So the old adage, Steve, the more the thing that things change, the more they remain the same, couldn't be more apropos for this time, could it? Well, it couldn't be, Steve, but what makes it more lethal in this case, as you know, I went against Bush Jr. I had worked with our military to basically reestablish and get rid of the neocons at the time and uh, bring in some of uh, Bush Sr.'s uh, people like Gates and others who were more reasonable. Unfortunately, what's happening in this administration is that Obama has a personality trait that knows really no restrictions on what he will say to anybody in anything and will promise everything to anybody. Of course, by definition, that's a politician. But what makes him particularly different is that he is really raising expectations and false expectations and cannot fulfill his promise. And in that process, he has created a vitriolic vacuum, which eventually will create disturbance and violence in the streets, which he knows very well will be imminent. And that's why he and his minions, uh, his immediate minions in the White House, elsewhere, who, by the way, have not changed, they're the same defunct minions who were there in the Carter administration when I was there, Richard Holbrook, uh, a whole bunch of them, uh, Hillary Clinton. I mean, you're talking about people who have never proven their mettle and their worth, have been reshuffled through and went through the Clinton administration with our great president, Bill Clinton, who uh, was fellated in the White House, who was cowardly in foreign affairs, who created the rendition. Most people don't know that he was the uh, uh, founder of the rendition, that is, people being taken overseas and tortured, and then it was continued by Bush. And basically uh, what we had was false promises and the Carter administ Clinton administration back in. I mean, this was really, to me, uh, amazing that the American public fell for everything that he said and uh, the psyops that was performed because basically these are 90% of Hillary Clinton's people. And Clinton's people. So there was no change in administration. We right. had a corrupt Clinton, we had a corrupt Bush, now we have a corrupt Obama. Everybody on his team is exceedingly corrupt and ineffectual. Well, let me ask you this question because this is going to, we're going to cover a lot of ground. As you know, we're right into right. The, the subject. Let me uh, talk about some of your foreign experience in the field and talk about the same uh, principles being applied to the United States that, quite candidly, you originated when you were responsible for taking down the Soviet Union, putting out Pol Pot. Give the people so they understand this is your expertise. This is why you were Deputy Secretary, uh, you know, Deputy Undersecretary. Uh, well, let me just correct this. So I'll give it. The, I'll give the people. The, uh, you know, the title sounds fancy. It was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. By right. some of you will remember me. Some of you won't. But that's fine. Uh, it sounds a little bit more phenomenal than it is. Uh, my official title is Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. It was created by me by Secretary of State Kissinger and President Nixon because I was trained at Harvard in psychiatry and I had a Ph.D. in national relations. I, I was an expert, probably the first world expert, on hostage negotiating, developed, developed all the principles, strategy, and tactics that were eventually used uh, and unfortunately were bastardized by the FBI that did not perform well. We will discuss that later on throughout about 20, 30 years. They, they're great self-promoters. But basically what I did was to create strategies, tactics, not to basically talk about somebody's addiction or their mental health, but to really understand uh, how do you neutralize uh, somebody like Arafat? Uh, what is it that you have to do in order to capture him? 
what is it that we have to do to take down the Soviet Union? And in the case of Reagan, because he was unusually smart and also because he was in the movie business, he understood the power of several elements. So when I was uh, uh, commissioned to do this, I went to the Rand Corporation in, in Santa Monica and developed the architecture for the takedown of the Soviet Union, uh, creating uh, using several different variables. Number one, I had worked in the Soviet Union under Nixon to take Christians out of uh, psychiatric hospitals who were incarcerated uh, uh, unfairly and illegally under a psychiatric term called sluggish schizophrenia, which did not exist. So I created, I commoditized the Christians who were incarcerated and we got them out uh, using uh, uh, various other elements. So I understood the Russian mentality. Number two, uh, I used the elements of the church that was the Pope, Pope John, who was very helpful. I used the uh, chairman of the Soviet uh, uh, Republic, uh, the Soviet system, communist system at the time, uh, Gorbachev. I understood his style. He was very uh, uh, particular. He's very compulsive. He was an engineer with a law degree. And I taught Reagan, basically, to stand his ground with some of my CIA colleagues who were there, I, mean, I give credit to the CIA as well, not the ones who are there now, but who had been there 20, 30 years ago, and understood that we were going to track Gorbachev in the negotiations by continuously creating and repeating a thing called SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, which at that time was a PSYOPs operation. We then increased the budget of the United States through SDI, and that scared the Russians, and then what we did was to take the Supreme Allied Commander of the uh, Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Navy and Army, a man by the name of Akramayev, Admiral Akramayev, who was very bright. Uh, we personally took him on an aircraft carrier to show him how our planes go off the aircraft carrier, how efficient we are, and at the same time how concerned we are about our sailors because uh, the Russian Navy was notorious for allowing the men to die in the submarines, uh, and Akramayev had never seen anything like that, although from spy planes he had seen what we did. Then to make the point that our military was much stronger than the Soviet military, we didn't have to go to war with them, we basically placed uh, five P-72 tanks, which is what they had at the time, and we took a M1 Abrams, which was the tank we had 20 years ago, and in 30 seconds we showed him that the M1 Abrams could decimate the entire T-72. So immediately he understood that his army was defeated. There was no way metal on metal that the Russians could ever confront on World War III the hypothesis or, or realize that hypothesis that they could invade Europe or uh, attack any uh, element of the United States because we would have defeated them. So we had three elements. We took over the religious element that was uh, Pope, and we spread that religion through uh, Poland into the Soviet Union, reactivated Greek Orthodoxy and Christianity. That broke, uh, that created agitation. We then uh, neutralized the military through a PSYOPs operation, which was basically to take their tanks out. Uh, then we, uh, we forced them to break up their uh, economy through uh, ramming up their budget to meet something called the SDI, which they didn't know what it was. And the fourth thing we did was something that I came to, uh, both by proclivity, and it shows you my own sense of humor, but my own uh, particular love for American rock and roll. Uh, when I was in the Soviet Union 20 years before that, uh, I found out from many of the dissidents that they loved rock and roll, American rock and roll. And when I saw some of their secret uh, discotheques, I realized that the KGB could not really handle the children because they came out of the nomenclatura. They were very wild and woolly, but they really snuck in a lot of our records, a lot of our blue jeans. And so we, uh, through the agents, where it was a psychiatrist like I am, but Karacha, quote, escaped. Richard allowed him to escape, and he was picked up about nine months ago in Serbia, working as a naturopathic doctor, and guess what he said? Karacha was absolutely honest, because I know from other sources in the intelligence community, he said, Richard Holbrook allowed me to escape and gave me a a pension every month for the past 10 years and promised I wouldn't be arrested. That's our Richard Holbrook, who's now in Pakistan, now in Afghanistan, claiming that we have to stabilize Pakistan, which is a totally corrupt country and does not exist, because the Taliban's are a threat to us. No, the Taliban's are not a threat to us. The Islamic fundamentalists, whom we had used under the Soviet Union, they're more than happy to stay there where they are, have nothing to do with us, and guess what they do most effectively? They increase the opium trade. They claim they decrease it, but they make all kinds of deals on the opium trade. And guess who controls the Taliban's 
besides the Pakistani ISI, which is the Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, which was created by the CIA, one-third of Afghanistan is controlled by Iran. So we do not belong there. If the President of the United States does not understand this, Mr. Obama, then he's not a very smart man. But I think he is the smart man, and I think he's trying to do what he can. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But I think he will, tell, he will do anything to look good and to make promises as if he were doing something. And in, in short, he's ineffectual. His deputy, his national security advisor, is the General Jones, who's completely ineffectual. He has done nothing. He's a total disappointment now. He's a four-star commandant from the Marine Corps. Most people felt he was a disaster. He still is. He left the Marine Corps and became head of uh, the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, made $900,000. So what we have here is a system of PSYOPs to continue the military-industrial complex, which I feel is a very detrimental element to the United States. And so did Eisenhower. He warned us of men who leave the government and go back into building more weapons systems, like the F-22, which we don't need, the carriers we don't need. I mean, it's just endless perpetration of their own powers. And our generals are making a lot of money, whether they're working for L3 Communication, Northrop Grumman, Lincoln Road, I can give you a whole list of them, and they refuse to stand up and be counted as individuals and really serve our country. Now, they will be indignant and say, oh, well, but I have served my country, now I want to make money. No, you make money by doing what you have to do in another area, not by prostituting yourself. So that's one. Number two, we have the problem of the mercenaries. And those mercenaries are now spreading out domestically because under the Blackwater label, you have a lot of private security companies in the United States that are, quote, uh, fulfilling the gap, or filling the gap where local policemen are not able, police forces are not able to man their own stations, whether it's Charlotte, North Carolina, whether it's in Oakland, California. Police departments have been depleted of their policemen. Guess where they went? They went to the Iraq War. Guess what happens? They're extremely well trained. I work with local police here in Miami and elsewhere. They are very good. For the most part, overall, the local police departments are exceedingly good. The problem is the states claim, and so do the counties, that we can't afford them because they cost us six figures. So instead of having one policeman for 100000 and 120000 who's putting his line or her line on the life, we're going to hire four low-grade, low-quality, TSA type of people who don't even speak English, know nothing about guns, who are certified to use a gun, have no police training whatsoever, and we're going to have four incompetents instead of one competence. So for 100,000, instead of having one policeman, I could have two or three security guards. So there you have the privatization of our internal security as a result of our privatization of our national security, and now we get to the privatization of our intelligence system, which has never been great. The men and women who served with me in the national security are all gone and disgusted. They've left. Many of them in use as consultants, Iran, Afghanistan, and they're disgusted. I mean, I have one friend who was head of counterintelligence. He said, I can't take it anymore. This is beyond the pale. Why? Because 80% of our intelligence system in the CIA, in the National Security Agency, in the NRO, in the National Geographic Agency, in the Satellite Agency, are all outsourced out to McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed Martin, once again to the military-industrial complex where it's just a revolving chair. And what happens is we get incompetent intelligence because we don't have human intelligence. God forbid somebody should go in the field. We don't know how to train them in human because nobody's trained as I was in psychology, national characters, psyops. We claim we have better intelligence, but we appoint a man like Panetta, who really has never had any experience, doesn't know anything about intelligence, is a politician. And in turns, we appoint a, a military a, admiral, Blair, who's probably a nice guy, but not really all that effectual in intelligence. And then we have a system that really cannot produce anything. We have thousands of analysts and no hard data. But the problem in this whole intelligence system is that 80% do not work for the U.S. government. They work for outsourcing companies. So what happens? You get a candidate who comes into the CIA. He gets trained by the CIA, our government. He leaves that position. Let's say it's whatever is an analyst. He gets hired by SAIC, which is one of the uh, Beltway Bandits, 
and comes back at three times the same salary in the same position. So we have bloated our government, we have perpetuated incompetence, and we are headed for self-destruction. Now, I've said this a year ago. I said it two years ago. And what happens is the American public hasn't really awoken to this yet. And the reason for it is they believe the ballot is the best way. No, the ballot is not the best way. All the ballot does is to reaffirm a two-party system which is already corrupt and basically voting for people who are never qualified. McCain was not qualified to be president of the United States. I mean, he was a hostage. I trained a lot of hostages, and I worked with hostages. I saved over 500 hostages. And I used to say to my military men, being a hostage is not a hero. Taking hostages, you become a hero. So we didn't have viable candidates. Palin was, of course, a jerk. Biden is not very bright. And you got a guy, Obama, whose best efforts was to organize in the streets. So basically, you had a PSYOPs machinery that worked on the Internet. Now, what I'm getting to is very simple. Either the audience that you're listening, that's listening here, is going to hear it again. We do not have a democracy. We have a republic. The republic is dysfunctional because the people who are being reelected are bloated, are corrupt, are incompetent, they're lazy. I mean, how many other adjectives would you like me to say? And I'm not coming out of any extreme, be it the right or the left. I'm just telling it to you as a doctor, psychiatrist as a person who's been operational and who knows many of these congressmen and senators. Believe me, I know them. I've treated them. I've worked with them. And they are people who have never had their own jobs, have never been able to go out like you and I in America to learn how to manage a mortgage, to learn how to manage a cash flow, to have employees, to build a business. You know why? Because they're scared. Yet if you look at their net worth, this president who makes 160 some odd dollars, let's say 180,000 as a senator, his net worth as a senator was 2.2 million. Now how in God's name did he get to 2.2 million when he's supposed to be a full-time senator and his net worth went to 2.2? The answer was he wasn't a full-time senator. If you ask anybody in the Senate, he didn't do anything in the Senate, as most people know. Instead, he immediately went and got a book contract that gave him the money. But he's not up for scrutiny. The same thing, you look at Christopher Dodd. Where was the indictment? Why is he making that kind of money? Because he has lobbyists who are coming in the banking system. Max Baucus of Montana is famous for being the harlot of K Street. Every one of the people on K Street has either worked on the Senate Finance Committee under Max Baucus, that little state of Montana that you and I live in, has had experience with Max Baucus, and Max Baucus' donations, and you can look them up, I don't make it up, come from Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Ron Rubin, Larry Summers, and I remember Max only had to make $6 million for 30 dinners that he had to have before he was even elected, re-again, re-elected again in, in Montana. In other words, he's incompetent. He's ineffectual. But the American people decide that's what he wants. So I put the blame back on your audience, that until they say, I'm sick and tired, you go back out into the streets, and you make sure that your voices are heard with the placards that I saw in Bozeman, Montana, and the 500 other areas, and you ignore the titles that are given to us, i.e. extremism, right-wing terrorists. There's no right-wing terrorists. The only terrorism you have here is the terrorism of the government, the suppression of liberties, the fact that the FBI once again does what we call an S-1 that they did during Vietnam. They go around, they spy on all the mass meetings, they want to know the names and numbers of the people who attend these meetings so that they can have it on a file. In effect, they are a totally ineffectual group. When it came to hostage negotiation and the Hanafi Muslim, they were worthless. They had no snipers. They had no capability. But what the FBI is great at is self-promotion. They are great from the day of that homosexual, that closet homosexual, J. Edgar Hoover, who people knew about, who lived with the man for 30 years, and I have nothing against homosexuals per se, but this was a hypocrite, to the day they are today Mueller, they know that they're ineffectual. And they know that all they can do is collect information on everybody, possibly even me, I hope so, but they can get my name spelled correctly, and they monitor us. That's called an S-1. But in effect, what you saw in that hostage negotiation with the, 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 uh, with the captain on the dinghy, that was pathetic to have five different gunboats and to have the military all around and to call three snipers a hero, that's not exactly what we're about in America. 
I had over 156 hostages, no snipers, and we were able to get it out using PSYOPs. So what am I saying in effect? We have, we have continued to go downhill from the days of Clinton, Bush Jr., who was a disaster, to now Obama and Biden, who's as, as stupid as, the, as a man I can find, a man who says to you, in 1929, Franklin Roosevelt gave a speech on the Depression on television. Well, for those who you may not know, people like me know, there was no television in 1929. There was no uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So what you have here are, again, it's a club of wealthy men in the Senate who never earned their, they never earned their keeps by their own medal. They never earned anything on their own. They're totally spoiled. They have their own health care system. So what happens in return is they don't mind putting out all kinds of money to make sure that we don't have our own health care system. Our education system is a disaster. Our military is a disaster because no one's in control. It's totally bloated. Bob Gates said it. Our, our incursions into foreign countries should never have existed. Right now, we have 178 uh, countries and 223 bases all over the United of the world. We don't have that many terrorists. We have two to three bases in Bulgaria, two to three bases in Romania. There are no terrorists there. So the answer is either this army has to get their thing together and start to realize that this can't continue because they've lost every war. And I've said it to our generals. You have lost every war you have been in, from Korea to Vietnam to Panama, which was not a war, to Haiti, to Grenada, which was not a war, to the first Iraq war and the second Iraq war, and now Afghanistan. And you should be ashamed of yourself. But instead of standing up to your civilian commanders and telling them, this is not the way you use an M a military force which is sharp, capable, and to use it at will on the wrong issues of national security, we have destroyed our own army. And this is what Obama is continuing to do. So well, we're in a very sad state. The economic issue, you have said brilliantly, Steve, where we were. You called the date that it occurred, October 8th. I'll never forget that. And at the same time, you explained how the banks were going under. And the banks will go under. And this economy is a disaster because the banks are run by people who are ineffectual, people who received, who had lobbyists to lobby Max and Christopher Dodd and Barney Frank, who was the first one to give uh, FHA and FDI and, and, uh, and uh, Fannie Mae all the rights and regulations that they needed to expand their loan and knowing fully well these loans would never be covered and they said, oh my God, I didn't know about it. You had Hank Greenberg of AIG corrupt. You had Goldman Sachs corrupt. You have Bank of America that's corrupt. You have Larry Summers who's corrupt, makes $5.1 million dollars of which 4.8 is given to him by a hedge fund while he's the head of the Economic Council and receives $135,000 in speeches to Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, uh, J.P. Morgan at our expense and money. All right, so the egregious amount of corruption, ineffectualness, and suppression of liberties is where we are now. And now I'm saying to the American public and to your listeners, what do you want to do? If you want to sit home, then don't complain. If you've come out to do what you did at the Tea Party, although I would like to call this something else because I don't think it's a Tea Party and a protest, that's the beginning of it. But you're going to have to do a lot more than you've been doing because the economy and this country is going into the toilet. This is the end of Pax Americana. The Chinese know it. India knows it. Other countries around the world. So you have neither safety you have neither national security, you don't have a health system, you don't have a military system, you don't have an intelligence system, you don't have an education system. In short, the social contract has been broken by de facto by the governments of Bush, Clinton, Obama. It didn't matter. By increased power, decreased services, and the individuals suppressed by the dominance of the federal power. Hey, Steve. This is where the Steve. American public has to come for it. Let me ask you this. Let me take it now into what's going on right now, and I want to ask you some questions, okay? Mm -hmm. People who have been, and, and uh, from a psychological operation, and by the way, Henry Kissinger is on record as stating, you know, I'm just getting emails 
uh, you know, your 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 guest uh, he uh, thinks Kissinger is a good guy. Kissinger just stated that. I didn't that, say he was a good guy. I know. I, just, I worked for Henry Kissinger. I didn't say he was a good guy. Right. I didn't get along with him personally. Right. But the deal is, is he just is on record as saying that by September, all private firearms in America will be gone, okay? That's, well, let me put it this way. Henry Kissinger likes to shoot his mouth off on a lot of things. He's not a man of great uh, valor. He's not a man who's of great integrity or great honesty. I didn't work for him because I liked him. I didn't, as a matter of fact, I didn't. I was against the war, and I was put in a special position where I didn't have to interact with him personally or professionally because I didn't agree with him. And I found him, quite frankly, to be a coward, to be a liar, and, and probably a war criminal, he and McNamara, because they lied about the Gulf of Tonkin, they lied about the whole issue of Vietnam. So let's get that straight. I, I have no loyalty to Kissinger. Thank you. I worked for the administration because I wanted to get Nixon out, and he was under when he was in trouble at the same time to try to pull out soldiers out of Vietnam, what we call E and E, because it was a bad war, as most of these wars were. So when Kissinger says they're going to take our guns away, you know. You have to look at it with a grain of salt, but the real issue is if they're going to suppress, they, the government, are going to suppress our rights to the gun. I'm a Second Amendment person, but at the same time, I'm pragmatic. So if I'm being told that guns are being shipped in from the United States into Mexico because there's a drug cartel war going on, which there is, then I want to know where in God's name is it say is anybody mentioning the fact that the number one shipper of guns, ammunition, I'm not talking about nuclear weapons, I'm talking about tactical, ammo, regular AK-47s, is the number one manufacturer and shipper around the world is the United States government. The number two is China. The number three is Russia. Number four is France. And number five is England. Now, if you listen to what I just told you, who are the members of the Perm Five at the UN? United States, China, France, England, and Russia. Isn't that a little bizarre? Well, it's predictable, Steve, and we all know that, that the idea is, is that the, the power base is a financial base. But here's what I want you to address, too. The idea, okay, now look, I had... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel in my office from NORTHCOM, okay? Mm -hmm. And I know his name, and those of you can, you know, go right. drown yourselves. Who, you know, here's the thing. It's amazing. Everybody believes the mainstream media, and they always use anonymous sources. But when we get people that basically uh, uh, would be liquidated immediately telling stuff, somehow all the paid shills on all the different boards say, oh, those guys are just, you know, crazy. But here's, here's what I want to address, okay? Yeah. The idea is... And I have been told this, and others have been told this, that specifically that the Obama administration, prior to the inauguration, was spending 80% of its time on figuring out how to take away the weapons. Okay, now listen, yeah. people think that they have First Amendment rights. Well, we're seeing all sorts of the overstepping, and, and I've been told this, I've been told this by, by the, the people that are absolutely bound and determined to destroy this country, and in my opinion, they've effectively neutralized the Constitution, because most people don't even know what the Constitution's about, but the fact is, is that it is their design, their desire, and their implementation goal, it's their a priori uh, emphasis right now to disarm the American population. Good example, Obama just passed, a law, or Obama's just proposed a law that basically reloading is going to be illegal. Somebody said that 